So crappy. Okay, I'm letting everybody into the meeting. And it looks like we are streaming and recording. So Don, whenever you're ready. Okay, here we go. Pursuant to Governor Baker's COVID-19 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, General Laws Chapter 30A, Section 18, imposing strict limitations on the number of people that may gather in one place. This meeting of the Wilmington Conservation Commission is being conducted via remote participation. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. Members of the public who would like to participate in the meeting via Zoom can do so by clicking on the published link. Members of the public who would like to listen to this meeting while in progress may also do so via telephone by dialing 1-646-558-8656 and enter meeting ID 823-9147. Four seven nine seven. Press pound and press pound again at the next voice prompt. Members of the public attending this meeting virtually will be allowed to make comments if they wish to do so during the portion of the hearing designated for public comment by following the steps previously noted, then press star nine on their telephone keypad. This will notify the meeting host that the caller wishes to speak. In the event that despite our best efforts, we are not able to provide for real-time access, we will post a record of this meeting on the town's website as soon as we are able. So let's yeah. do a roll call. Yeah. Um, Vinny, are you here? Yeah. Laura? Yes, I'm here. Thanks. Ron? Yes, I'm here. Uh, Alex and myself, Don Pearson, am here. Um, our first item on the agenda is discussion uh, on Silver Lake. Yeah, uh, good evening, everybody, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission. Um, again, Jamie McGall, the operations manager for Wilmington DPW. Back tonight to discuss the annual um, talk, I guess, about the invasive species project at Silver Lake. Believe it or not, this is the 13th year of this ongoing project, um, which most likely will be going on forever. You know, invasive species control is something that doesn't really stop, it's ongoing monitoring. And again, this is our 13th year. Very proud of the success of this project. And um, I'm here tonight with Keith Gazelle from Solitude Lake Management. Solitude is the town's biology consultant for the Silver Lake Invasive Species Control Project. So um, a spring survey was done and Keith is here tonight to discuss what he found and we'll have a little discussion on what we'd like our plan to be for 2021. So at this point, I'll turn it over to uh, Keith Gazelle if he's here. Yes, Thanks, Jimmy, I, I am. Um, yeah, as, as Jamie indicated, we did perform a, a vegetation survey actually on, on Monday the 3rd um, and did find growth of uh, Eurasian water milfoil. Uh, again, not widespread or overly dense, but uh, did start to see some regrowth of plants. Um, we did observe some um, growth of the other invasive uh, target, um, which is curly leaf pondweed. Uh, we did see some reproductive bodies, um, a, a turion. Uh, and so I think based on those conditions and the fact that we um, did not conduct um, any active management work uh, in 2020, um, it would be kind of our recommendation for uh, the town to consider moving forward with management of those plants. Um, however, I think given kind of the, the level of growth that we observed at the time of the survey, 
uh, it probably warrants waiting uh, a couple of weeks towards the end of this month to kind of see you know, what other plants emerge um, kind of in that time frame, and really to make sure that we conduct the treatment of time in order to kind of capture all those plants that, that potentially are there. So we're still early in the season. Uh, with a couple of more weeks of growth, we may um, have a better handle on kind of the full extent of uh, the target plant growth uh, for 2021. Thanks, Keith. And I, I would add to that, uh, Keith touched upon it, we did not do any sort of herbicide treatment at the lake last year, nor did we do it in 2019. So that two year uh, pause, so to speak, where we didn't do any herbicide treatment was the longest consecutive span of years that we did not do any herbicide treatment in the last 12 years. So uh, based on that fact as well, I really do think that we're due for an herbicide treatment. We had several complaints from lake residents last year toward the middle of the summer that the milfoil had returned, not only returned, but returned to the point that it was affecting um, their recreational activities along the lake shore. And keeping that in mind, I guess what we're looking for from the commission is just support that uh, as the season progresses, most likely at the end of May toward the beginning of June, we'll be looking to do a, an herbicide treatment and I would rely on Keith, you know, we would make the decision based on the amount of plants, but we've typically been treating at a rate of a gallon per acre. I would assume most likely would be looking to treat at the same concentration. So I think if, uh, barring no further information, um, at this point, we'll take any questions. Okay. Are there any questions from the commission? I have one that may not be straight on. When walking around the lake a, a year ago, I, I noticed a culvert emptying into the lake and looked at the uh, local GIS map. And I, I think there's a total of six of them. Do, do we do any testing to, to see what is flowing into the lake through those culverts, road salt or uh, pesticides or fertilizers or, or things that might affect the, uh, the lake? Yeah, I mean, we do do culvert testing as part of our NIPTES uh, stormwater program. We are required to do wet weather flow sampling and dry weather flow sampling from culverts. Um, this has been going on for years. And uh, to my knowledge, uh, typically we'll do dry weather flow sampling because if it's dry out and you have flow coming out of a culvert, that's could be considered what's called an illicit discharge, which means some sort of illegal connection to the stormwater system. Obviously, if it's not raining and it hasn't been for a few days and you have flow coming out of a culvert, the water's coming from somewhere. A lot of times it's just groundwater infiltration, uh, so we'll test it. But um, we haven't, to my knowledge, had any indication that there is anything illicit flowing into the lake. Um, and that's uh, really run by our engineering department, and that is an ongoing project. So we're keeping an eye on that as well. Thank you. Thanks. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, so, so basically, uh, we're. I'm sort of nodding here. We're we're, we're giving uh, Jamie and Keith uh, a couple of weeks to see where growth occurs, and presuming that they will treat it as they've treated it in the past. And if not, they'll come back and talk to us in June. Is that right? That, that sounds great. And obviously, if we do choose to treat, um, I'll update Valerie and Cameron um, with some correspondence. And obviously, we would adhere to the orders, um, the conditions in the order of conditions for, for this project, namely blocking the outlet um, you know, after, uh, during and after the treatment so that nothing gets downstream and obviously doing the required postings around the lake as we have been in the past. Good. Thanks a lot for your time. Thank you. Sure. Um, let's see. It being time, we can move to the next uh, item on the agenda, which is a request for determination for 24 Washington Ave.
I believe the homeowner is here. If he wants yep. to say something, just can you hear me? Yes, we yes. can. All right, great. Yeah, um, yeah. I've submitted uh, this request for termination on uh, front entrance addition four by eight, as well as a four by eight front porch. Um, submitted the updated ground survey uh, from PFS land surveyor, uh, as well as the um, the plans. Uh, for the addition itself. Um, work is within the 100 foot buffer zone outside of the 20 foot no build line. Um, and the land survey was updated in uh, March, again, by PFS land surveyor. So I'm not sure if there's any questions for me. Uh, thanks, Sean. Um, hmm. Cameron, do you, do you have the advice to pass along? Uh, we have no comments. Um... I asked John a couple of weeks ago to show erosion control and um, a stop piling location on the plan, which he did, which is what you're seeing in front of us. Um, so, you know, other than that, we didn't really have any comments. Okay. Other than actually, Sean, uh, we, we were, we tried to look around. Um, we were trying to figure out who, who delineated um, the wetlands. Do you know off the top of your head? We we're just trying to figure out through the paperwork, but we couldn't seem to find it. Uh, I did have it on the last time we did this. Um, I would have to get back to you on that. Okay. But I can I can shoot you a note on who did it last time for us. It wasn't PFS. It was a different surveying company. Okay. I think the flags are still out there if you, if you noticed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I drove by <laughs> some. <laughs> but yeah, um, other than that, uh, we have no other comments. Thanks. Uh, any comments, Vinny? Yep. How about you, Laura? Um, just the uh, the memo mentions a twenty five foot no disturb line. I is that the supposed to be the fifteen foot no disturb or the twenty five foot no build? Or um, I... Yeah, on the memo we must have. Uh... Yeah, sorry about that. It's 25 foot, no, no, no build, 15 okay. foot, no disturb. Thank you. My apologies. Thanks, Ron. Laura? No, you I'm always there? afraid I'm missing something. No. So that's why I asked. <laughs> I, I didn't have anything. Okay, thank you. Uh, Alex? Uh, and I did not have any comments or questions either. Are there any comments or questions from the public on the uh, RDA for 24 Washington Ave? I do not see any hands raised, Mr. Chairman. Okay, hearing none. Is this a negative three by chance? It is. Okay. Uh, could I have a motion to issue a negative determination for 24 Washington Ave, negative three determination for 24 Washington Ave, please. So moved. Thank you, Ron. And a second, please. Second. Benny, thank you very much. Um, Mr. Chairman, if I could, Mr. Certainly. Chairman, if I could just jump in, could we add, um, I know they show the erosion controls on the plan. Can we just add a condition um, with the determination that the conservation agent approve those erosion controls prior to construction? Okay, the maker of the motion, Ron, you feel okay? I'd be glad to withdraw and uh, re re move. <laughs> okay, and your second, Vinny, is that good for, good with you? Second. Okay, how do you vote, Vinny? Yes. Uh, Laura? Yes. Ron? Yes. Alex. Yes. And myself, yes. So next we have um, two RDAs for Upton Drive. And uh, we can take the, um, the Verizon um, so there's two, there's two applicants. Um, one is for yeah. Horizon, the other one okay. is for um, Vapor IO. Um, okay. So I think if you want to choose one of those, you could choose Verizon, you could choose Vapor either way. 
Um, let's go with Verizon first because it's at the top of the pile. Uh, so we have an RDA for 26 Upton Drive for Verizon as the applicant. Anyone yes. here to speak to that? Yes, good evening, Chair. <clears throat> Members of the Conservation Commission, my name is Daniel Klasnick. I'm pleased to be able to meet with you this evening. Uh, having received approval last evening from the planning board for the site plan and <clears throat> in the stormwater management permit, uh, I really uh, look forward to the opportunity to review this evening with the commission, the request for determination of applicability for the installation or co-location of Verizon Wireless's facility at uh, 26 Upton Drive. Just by way of a little background, I don't know if the commission is familiar with the property or not, but there's an existing 114 foot telecommunications tower that is uh, located on the property. And that is enclosed by a 51 by 51 foot graveled fenced area. Currently there is the ground equipment for two wireless service providers located within the, uh, within the fenced area. So through a, uh, a field study that was performed by uh, Besbane Wetland Consultant, the wetlands on the property uh, were delineated and a report was prepared. We included that report with our RDA submission. Um, with the filing, we also included a set of a survey plan where the wetland flags were also noted. Through the delineation in the survey, it was determined that the, uh, the wireless, the existing wireless telecommunications compound is located within the 100 foot buffer zone area of a, the bordering vegetated wetland. Uh, the project that Verizon Wireless is proposing involves the installation of a 10 by 20 concrete pad for Verizon Wireless's equipment cabinets. And they would also be installing an ice bridge uh, for the tele, uh, and they're bringing it up here now. Thank you very much, that's helpful. So as I was saying, um, this, these plans depict the overall site plan. We picked up the flags, we show the, the wetland delineation and then also the 100 foot buffer zone. And as I had indicated, the, uh, the compound, the existing compound areas located within that buffer zone. So what Verizon Wireless, as I was saying, was, is proposing to do is they would be installing their concrete pad and other equipment inside the footprint of the existing uh, compound area. The fiber and conduits that are necessary for the facility would also be located within the footprint of the existing 51 by 51 foot area. There would just need to be some trenching within that area. There's already an existing telco and a meter cabinet located there. So everything would be contained within there. And in working with the town engineer, the project also includes the installation of a stormwater detention trench that would be 20 feet long, running along the side of Verizon Wireless's equipment pad, uh, one and six inches feet wide, and then about a foot deep. And that would all be, have a one and one half inch crust stone uh, installed in there. We are also proposing to install a, a silt fence on the inside of the fenced area that would be installed and remain throughout construction. As I noted, there's not proposed any change in the size of the footprint of the existing 51 by 51 foot area. And as we outlined, I think in our filing, this is a request for a negative determination. Um, the installation of a concrete pad and the ice bridge and other the facilities uh, within the existing disturbed area uh, and with the installation of the silt fence on the inside of the construction. The, the entire project really will be surrounded by the erosion control measures and it does uh, and, the, and the installation itself is, is sort of a, a minor activity within the buffer zone in an already existing disturbed area. So I would submit that based upon uh, the CMR, that this is something that this board can review and grant a negative determination for, because it really won't have any differential impact on the resource or, or areas, as I said, because all the work will, will occur within the existing fenced compound area. Thank you. Uh, 
Cameron, what's your take on it? Um, I believe for this, for Verizon, we did not have um, any comments. Um, okay. And for the commissioners, if any, any questions, comments? I'm a little bit confused here. On, on this drawing, is, with the W, is that in the wetland? You know, the building is close to the wetland area. Yes, the existing, well, it's already an existing area, that rectangular, that's the existing fenced area. So that's already been installed. What Verizon Wireless is proposing to do is just to install their equipment pad up in that left-hand corner and then install an ice bridge. So everything, as I had said, will occur within the already disturbed footprint area of the, uh, of the actual compound. You can see the other equipment pads that are already installed uh, within that area as well. So what we're doing is we're utilizing the existing footprint to co-locate uh, exist uh, another wireless telecommunications facility this location. You wouldn't happen to know when I, I, the- I still uh, don't understand. That, that is a pad, right? Or you have a building there? No, what is being proposed by Verizon Wireless is to just install a concrete pad. And on the concrete pad, they would install equipment cabinets so there's no buildings proposed by Verizon Wireless. It's just the concrete pad. What's the platform cover? That is simply something that goes over the top of the equipment um, to protect it from the elements. It's just, it has metal stanchions on either side and rises above the above the actual cabinets and you and you don't have any walls that's correct there are no walls this is an open uh, install with just the concrete pad and the uh, and the equipment cabinets and then with the the cover okay I understand now turn on all set Are you good with it, Finney? Um, uh, yes, I am. Okay. Uh, Laura? No questions. Uh, Ron? I'm okay with this. Uh, Alex? Nope. Um, you know, to, to sort of um, write on Vinny's uh, observation, do you, do you know when the project, when, when the uh, fenced enclosure was um, put in place because it is. My, I'm sorry. Yeah, my I, understanding is that the facility was originally approved in 2003 and has been existing since then. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Thanks. Uh, is there any comment or? Well, actually, one more question: the uh, the roof on the enclosure, is it a a, a flat roof or peaked roof? No, it's not really a roof at all. It's more in the nature of sort of a, it's flat, but it's I wouldn't call it a roof per se. I mean, I think there's opening gaps between it. It's more just to keep the heavy snow and that sort of thing off of the cabinets, so that for servicing and other purposes. But it's it's not a peaked roof, no. All right. Um, are there any questions or comments from the public? I mean, if you do have a comment or question, please use the raise hand function. And um, we'll give just a second for folks to raise their hands if they have any questions or comments. And Mr. Chairman, if I could just add in, um, similar to the last um, determination, if you could just um, consider um, the erosion controls being approved by the conservation agent prior to construction. That would be great. We don't have any raised hands. Let's move on to uh, do the vote then. We, 
Um, I'd like a motion to issue a negative three determination for the Verizon portion of 26 Upton Drive with the condition that uh, in the erosion controls are installed and approved by the conservation <laughs> agent. Approved by, not installed by. Motion? So moved. Thank you, Vinny. A second? Second. Thank you, Ron. Um, how do you vote, Vinny? Yes. Laura? Yes. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Alex? Yes. Thank you. Ron? Yes. And uh, myself, yes. Thank you very much. I wanted to uh, thank the commission, Valerie, Cameron, and, and Kathy and everyone. Greatly appreciate everything. Wish you a good evening and a great summer. Thanks, you too. Okay, the uh, next item on the agenda is also 26 Upton Drive, but now for a uh, for Vapor as the applicant. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. yes. Great. Uh, my name is Michael Dolan. I am from the law firm of Brown Rudnick here on behalf of Vapor IO. Um, my client is similarly proposing to what uh, Verizon did some improvements within the existing fenced compound. Uh, we too will have a silt fence protection uh, feature. We'll also have the uh, stormwater infiltration trench, um, which we worked through with the town engineer. Uh, our improvements within the compound involve uh, two concrete pads upon which there will be uh, an enclosure uh, and some equipment. Um, the uh, the one thing that distinguishes our application from the previous one, however, is that we are also proposing a 10 by 10 concrete uh, slab uh, on the uh, outside of the compound, but further away from the wetland than the compound itself and actually over on uh, previously disturbed land, which is uh, of a gravel nature. Um, and what we're proposing there is there'll be a transformer put on that pad uh, by uh, Reading Light and Power. They've also recommended that we and guided us as to some bollards they want us to put on, put around that slab for protective measures. So we've got uh, that feature uh, outside the compound um, along with uh, a couple of caissons. Um, and uh, a little bit of underground conduit. Uh, but as I say, if you look at the uh, images on the screen right now, the wetland is to the uh, west of the compound. And what we're proposing on the uh, north, well, the more the easterly side, and if you will, on the right side of that compound uh, is just that much further away from uh, the uh, wetland and is likewise in the wetland buffer, just like the uh, compound itself. Um, we are similarly uh, requesting a negative determination uh, and we're free to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Uh, Cameron. Uh, we had a couple of comments on this one. Um, the first one would be that we recommend that they add erosion controls um, on around that uh, conduit on the outside of the of the compound, outside of the fencing. Um, and then we also recommend that they um, remove any of the trash that's in in that area where the con where that new pad is going. Because uh, when we went out, it seemed like there was there's a decent amount of, of trash in that area so uh you should get in there and remove that as well while they're at, while they're uh working we will absolutely take care of both of those perfect and other than that then uh, we had no other comments cameron did you get a sense of where the trash came from 
No, it's it's kind of, you know, it's it's back behind a, a warehouse building and down a little bit. So, you know, who who who's to say who who put it back there? Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, Vinny, any questions, comments? No, I don't. Um, Alex. No. Nope. Laura? No. Nope. Ron? Okay. Um, I have none as well. So are there any, is there any feedback from the audience for 26 Upton Drive the, with Vapor as the applicant? We do not have any raised hands, Mr. So um, again, where I, I would I would entertain a motion to issue a negative three determination with conditions that the erosion controls be uh, added around the excavation for the conduit, and that uh, trash and debris gets picked up. Anyone willing to make that motion? So moved. Thank you, Vinny. A second, please. Second. Thank you, Ron. Uh, to the vote, Vinny, how do you vote? Yes. Alex? Yes. Ron? Yes. Laura? Yes. And I vote yes as well. Consideration? Did I get everybody? That's it. Okay, good. Okay, the next item on the agenda is a request for determination of applicability for 29 Mystic Ave. Hi, Mr. Chair and members of the board. Um, Hello. Um, Brendan Mallon. I'm the uh, son-in-law of Terry Russo, who owns the, the property at 29 Mystic Ave. Um, so we're just requesting a negative determination to, she just needs, she's looking to build just a, a little carport roof overhang. I think if Valerie has the plan, I can explain it to you if, if it was in there. It's just a simple 22 by 16 flat roof that'll be attached to the side of her house and, and, and you know, supported by three four by fours and just to, to drive her car underneath um, her, her the, the existing stream runs along her house. So the, the frankly, the entire house is in the hundred foot buffer. Um, we plan on doing most of the, all the cuts and work and stuff like that'll happen way off on the right side of the property in the north side in the driveway. So we won't do any other than you know assembling and attaching back there, we're gonna you know take care of all the all the cutting and stuff will happen you know in the front, uh, little opposite direction, but over by where the septic is, um, we can we're planning to stage over there and do do all the preparation work there, and then we can bring it to the back and attach it to the house. Um, and she's you know there's a. The edge of it is about 30 foot from the line. There's an existing fence that that blocks the, the the brook, and the brook is, you know, depending on the time of year, it's it's relatively down, substantially lower than the the grade of her yard, um, and that's really it. Just a, a simple uh, a simple carport overhang. If I don't know if this thing can share the screen, if it can, I have a, a sample picture of. I can show you what it would look like, but yeah, I know we're looking at it, Brendan. Oh, okay. Well, Thanks. I meant the, the actual like rendering of what it would look like. Um, okay. If you want to see, you know, what I was referring to. Um, does this thing share screen? Can I do it on my own? Yes, it does. Okay. I think Valerie will. Yeah, I got it. it. There you go. I just wanted to. So just, if you can see that, just something like that. Um, pretty simple. Mm-hmm. Thanks. Yep. Uh, Cameron, any 
any input from you? Um, our only comment was just uh, to add erosion control uh, before construction starts. Sure, we can do that. Just along the along the fence line there. Yeah, yeah. Um, we can coordinate a time, and I can um, before I can come out and, and show you. Uh, okay. Where, and then and we can go from there. Perfect. And other Thanks. than that, I had no we had no other comments. Uh, how about you, Vinny? I'm okay. Alex? I don't have any questions. No problem. Laura? I'm okay with Good. it. Thanks. Ron? I'm okay. Um, and I'm okay with it as well. So um, may I have a motion to issue a negative three determination for 29 Mystic Ave. Uh, sorry. Any, any, any feedback from the audience? We don't have any raised hands. No raised hands. Okay. Damn, I wasted a few words there. Uh, so I'd like a motion to issue a negative three determination with uh, the condition that the erosion controls get um, approved by the conservation agent. So moved. Thanks, Vinny. A second, please. Second. And who is that, Alex? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, how do you vote, Vinny? Yes. Alex? Yes. Laura? Yes. Ron? Yes. Uh, I vote yes as well. So you're all set. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time. Sure. Good night. Okay, the next item on the agenda, it being 740, is a notice of intent for Salem Street Rear Wellfields. Hi, thank you. My name is Joe Labeo. I'm the business and utility manager for the Wilmington Department of Public Works. And uh, along with me in the Zoom, we have Tyler Bernier and I believe Kirsten Ryan. They are from Kleinfelder. They're the consultant, uh, the engineer, and the, the uh, firm who designed this project. So the point of tonight is simply to introduce the project, uh, receive comments, and then incorporate those comments as we move forward. So as you might know, this is a town of Wilmington project that involves the installation of three wells and associated piping at the Salem Street well field. This is an existing town owned and operated active well field. Uh, it's one of the four active sources that supplies drinking water to the town of Wilmington. And if you don't know, it's located down off the access road behind Shea Concrete off of Salem Street. So for context, I'll give you a quick history of the well and, and why we're here tonight. So there are currently three total wells on this site. Uh, the first well was constructed in 1969 and then two additional satellite wells were constructed in the mid 2000s. The yield, which is essentially the production levels of the wells has deteriorated substantially over the years due to clogging, corrosion and other required maintenance and repair activities. Where we are today is these wells are essentially at the end of their useful life. And at this point in time, replacement is the best option. The project's scope is to restore the lost yield by installing three 18 inch by 24 inch diameter wells and some segments on site of ductile iron pipe that will connect these new wells to the existing underground infrastructure, as I mentioned, is already on site. In addition, there'll be some new fencing installed, some electrical component improvements within the existing building. And then ultimately, the wells that are currently being used will be abandoned per mass DEP specifications. All the proposed work is outside the bordering vegetated wetlands, but it is within the 100 foot buffer zone and the riverfront. As I mentioned, Kleinfelder, they're here on the Zoom, they'll be able to specifically answer and elaborate on any questions you may have. But just in general, we look forward to working with the Conservation Commission, the Planning Department. And with that, I guess I'll introduce Tyler from Kleinfelder. Good evening, everybody. Um, I think Joe pretty much 
covered most of the most of the um, scope of the project. Um, we have about 7,200 square feet of um, project area. Um, as Joe said, it's it's within the buffer zone and it's within the riverfront area, and it is also um, located within the flood zone, so it's um, bordering land subject to flooding. Um, as Joe said, project um, is the exterior work is is not a ton of work. Um, we're just going to be installing three new wells and then we're going to be running about 90 linear feet of six inch ductile iron pipe to um, connect the new wells to the existing, to the existing piping in the, in the yard of the pump station. Um, we'll also need to run some electrical conduits to the new wells to power the level transducers and the pumps, the submersible pumps that are located within the wells. Um, we do need to expand the fence line along the, I believe it's the east side of the project site in order to incorporate or have security around one of the new wells that we're installing. Um, we've, we've kept that fence line outside of the bordering vegetated wetland so that we don't need to enter the wetland to install that. And then um, we, we've also kept our erosion controls um, out of the bordering vegetated wetlands so we don't have to have anybody in there digging digging in silt fencing. Um, we do need to remove two um, 15 inch deciduous trees on the east side of the project area where, where we're extending the fencing. Um, and, and those trees are, we're gonna replace them on a one-to-one -one basis in kind um, as required by the Wellington tree replacement policy. Um, if you'd like, I don't know, Valerie, if you have the plans or if you'd like me to pull them up, I can show them to everyone. You can pull them up if you like. Sure, I have them ready right here. Um, should be seeing now. Yep. All right, so you can see, you know, all the existing infrastructure, the, the existing pump station, um, existing fence line, um, all of our planned erosion controls. Um, and then the three new wells are located um, here, oops, here and here. Um, we'll also be installing a small sampling station for the town to collect water quality samples. Um, this is pretty much within the, right along the edge of the gravel roadway that exists. And then here are the two trees that we'll need to remove to get this new fence extended. Um, I think that basically covers everything. If there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Don, I think you're muted. Good call. I was trying to throttle the clock. <laughs> um, so, uh, Cameron, do you have uh, comments from your side? You're muted. Cameron? 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 Sorry about that. <laughs> okay, gotcha. So um, me, and, me and Joe uh, had a conversation earlier this week. Um, as you can see on the, on the plan, it, it, the erosion control and fencing gets a little close in a couple areas. And we, um, but when me and Valerie went out, it, it, it's, it's, it's as far away as they can go. It's, it's pretty tight back there. So um, 
but me and Joe talked and he agreed that um, they should, in areas where they can move up the fence and erosion control. Um, but other than that, I think, I don't think we have any other comments. Yeah, we've we've intentionally made this this new fence line um, as close as we can. The difficulty is that they do need to get machinery in here to mm -hmm. redevelop these wells. Um, that's why we've installed. There's actually another fence opening in here, so they can back a truck in here. But we can't we we can't install that fence too closely to that that well, or else um, it will make redevelopment um, difficult or probably impossible. Yeah. Uh, that's it, Cameron. Uh, I believe so. If I'm missing anything, Valerie. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I just uh, maybe would add that um, when we went out, um, we looked at the the two trees that they're proposing to take out. They are, you know, pretty significant trees, but they they do have a lot of uh, bittersweet that's kind of wrapped around and kind of choking them. Um, that area that's going to be fenced in area. Um, there was a lot of kind of dead um, debris and kind of dead, um, tree pieces, a lot of seemingly invasives, a lot of bittersweet. Um, so we were sort of looking at that area to see what the impact on vegetation would be. Um, and considering what's there now, um, it, it wasn't as much of a concern, I guess, to us when we went out and actually looked at it. Actually, that makes it look nicer than it is. I have a few pictures of it here that I can kind of scroll through if you'd like. Um, so that was one thing that we wanted to take a look at just to see, you know, that area, what the clearing of that area would, um, how that would impact um, the overall, um, where they are proposing to uh, replace some trees. I think that's a, a, a good replacement. Uh, maybe those trees could be uh, field located with, um, with Cameron. Um, and then the other thing, um, when I first reviewed the plans that I wanted to pass along, because I think there were some questions um, about this, um, it, it almost appears from the plans that the riverfront line is taken from the center line of the brook. Um, in fact, it's not. If you scale it off, um, the riverfront, 100 and 200 foot riverfront were taken from the, um, the edge of the brook. Um, so I wanted to kind of point that out um, for folks, uh, for the commission and for folks in the audience, just to uh, maybe clear up some, some information. Thanks. Uh, the, uh, the, the stream, Martinsbrook is, is off, off the, the, the drawing, right? That's right. It's All right. Yeah, there's another drawing prior to the right before the one I was showing before that shows Martin's Brook and all the, the existing conditions. Okay. Right. And Mr. Chairman, the, um, the, um, it's like the same one, the town, yes. Yeah, that, so that's the that shows the the brook. They point out the center line of the brook, um, but the 100 foot, 200 foot were actually taken from the from the, what they could kind of delineate as the bank of that of the brook. It's not taken from the center line. Um, that, that's correct. I can confirm that from um, within the CAD profile. It's it's based off of the edge of the brook. And then, Mr. Chairman, the. Um, the town did um, did hire C Camp Environmental to go out and um, confirm the flagging for the wetlands. And Cameron and I did a site visit um, to check those flags as well. So that's uh, their report is pending. Uh, that report was included in your um, packet of information. Okay, then. And they and they they agreed to it. Correct. Okay. Terrific. Thank you. Uh, any questions from you, Vinny? Yeah, there, there was no mention of uh, the uh, water treatment of this water entering the pipelines, the town pipelines. Yeah, I can, I can answer that. Uh, sure. Tyler, I'll take it. Sure. So 
This is one of three active sources that ultimately end up being treated at the Sergeant Water Treatment Plant. Uh, the other one is across town. That's the Shawshina Ave well that, that is uh, reached by the Butters Row Water Treatment Plant. So the Sergeant Water Treatment Plant is located in Hathaway Acres and the other two wells that are treated by that plant along with the Salem Street well would be the Browns Crossing well field and also the Barrows well field, which is located behind the treatment plant itself. So you're saying that it is being treated? Yes, it's currently being treated. It has been for several decades and it will continue to be so. I'm all set. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Benny. Ron? I'm all set. Laura? No questions. Alex? No, no questions. Um, uh, the, the, the new wells are look to be adjacent to the existing wells? Um, they're, they're close. They're, they're not immediately adjacent to the existing wells. Um, we did some uh, preliminary test wells to determine the existing or, you know, the preferable locations. So some of these wells that you're seeing on the site plan are actually test wells that we installed to determine the best locations. Okay. But they are within 20, 30 feet of the existing wells. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, from the history that we got at the beginning of the presentation, um, apparently the output of the wells was below the target. Um, at some point, two more wells were added. And at some point, even they began to deliver less than um, the full amount that, that we were approved to take from the wells. Um, if we now have three wells that are going to be more capable of, of taking that target, um, I, I wonder if, if someone uh, and I don't know whether it's the consultants or the town is is thinking about the the uh, the effect on the the uh, neighboring uh, wetlands. Uh, we've had really dry years. The Ipswich River, uh, you know, is 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 basically um, really down pretty low, and in fact became an endangered river. And I, I'm I'm wondering if if you know the, if everyone's comfortable with having three new wells that are going to pump the amount that was okay to pump, you know, 25 years ago, um, or whether that's something that um, the town needs to do to have the capacity, but isn't going to, you know, is is going to take as little as possible in, in stressful years. Okay, can someone address that? I can address that. Yeah, the town, uh, we're limited with, with rurals, as you mentioned, per the DEP registration. Uh, I imagine even with these completed three wells, we will not be up at the peak of that withdrawal limit. Uh, however, we are in the fortunate position that we do have the ability to supplement our own sources with the MWA water, mm -hmm. which we have certainly done uh, since it was connected in 2009, primarily during warm weather months, uh, specifically as an example, during the drought conditions of last year, uh, we took as much water as, as possible actually per our contract with the MWRA. So we do certainly try to offset uh, water usage from the wells with MWRA water to meet the demand of the town at the same time. Did you get any sense from the DEP as to whether they're going to lower any of the, the uh, targets? Uh, no, I have not heard that they were willing or even uh, interested in lowering, lowering the actual withdrawal volumes for registrations. Okay. Is, is having three wells um, one of those things that, mm -hmm. that gives us the, the 
capacity? Don, there are, there are three wells currently at this site right now. Yeah. There, are, there are two yeah. exterior wells and there's one that's located within the pump station. Um, uh, yeah, I guess what I'm getting at is, you know, the, the if we're if we're taking you know substantially less than we're allowed to right now, is that the situation we're going to find ourselves in once we have three new wells? We're going to be um, we could take more from this location and take less and pay less to the MWRA. How, how does that get decided? really is based upon the demand of the town, so to speak. Some years are higher than others. Uh, as I mentioned, we usually use the MWA during the warmer weather months, typically starting around now, April, uh, and all throughout the summer. And then if you trend it over time, you'll see that as it gets colder, the usage overall from the town uh, declines. So the usage of the MWRA declines. It declines in in uh, winter. The, yes, the town the town water. We take less town water in the winter. The Sorry. opposite. We take less MWA water in the cold weather months. Okay. Sorry, that clock is pretty loud. Um, okay. So winter winter time we 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 draw more on the town water and less on MWRA. Yeah, okay. All right, now I'm, I'm all set then. Uh, is there, did I miss anyone? Is there anyone uh, in the audience who would like to comment? Uh, yeah, we do have several hands raised. Um, Wayne Castaway. Uh, has his hands up, hand up, um, and Suzanne Sullivan has her hand up. Okay, Wayne. Good evening, Wayne Castingway, Ipswich River Watershed Association. Apologize, we just heard about this project on the agenda, and we sent a letter, comment letter, over late this afternoon. And I'll just quickly summarize this. Um, we fully support the town's redevelopment of these wells. Um, we agree with the town and support the use of Ipswich River Watershed to meet Drinking water needs, we're, we, a um, big part of our mission is to keep water clean and healthy for everybody. So we support the project overall. I just would like to add um, to the chair's comment about withdrawal limits in the context, particularly um, the last five years where we've had really two severe droughts. And unfortunately, Martins Brook has become the poster child for the low flow issues in the Ipswich, and particularly this stretch of Martins Brook, which if we have anything below average rainfall, it, it dries. And in the last couple of droughts and even dry years, Martins Brook was a unique phenomena that you may or may not know about, but it reverses flow and flows backwards towards these wells um, during low flow conditions. And what we would ask is that the commission consider putting a flow trigger on the withdrawals of this well. You may recall back in 2006, the town created what's called a comprehensive water resources management plan, which the town agreed to and the state approved. And in that plan, the town was agreed to put a flow trigger on all of its withdrawals, below which they would switch to the MWRA. And that flow trigger is 0.43 cubic feet per second per square mile which is the ecological threshold that has been determined for the entire watershed. And that's, we don't feel that's a really onerous requirement and the town in the past has agreed to that. And that analog would be 18 cubic feet per second at the Middleton USGS gauge. So it could be easily monitored. And we have an initiative this year that we are gonna work with the community of Wilmington throughout this year to try to get that trigger back in to the plan, which um, we think would go a long way to preserving the wetland resources and the brooks. And we don't think it'll be onerous for the town because you've got that great MWRA connection. And so that's what 
request we would respectfully make with regard to this project. Thank you. Thanks. Um, and you said uh, Suzanne and or Martha? Yes, Suzanne Sullivan, put her hand up. Suzanne? She's not on my screen, that's why I asked. On, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, I can, tu I can turn on my um, video too, I guess. Um, hi everyone, Suzanne Sullivan, 60 Lawrence Street. Um, I echo all Wayne's comments and I just add, like to um, add a, a, a few more uh, just for the, the commission's information. Uh, last year we were in a drought and the town actually did a really good job. They were pumping from MWRA as they're supposed to in the summer months. And then come September, they switched back to um, the local uh, supply more heavily. And um, they pumped Martins Brook dry in a matter of like a month. Uh, these wells um, have a tremendous power and they, what happens is they actually take water and they create a Kona depression and they suck the water from the brook down into the wells. They're so powerful. And now with these new wells coming online, that's probably going to be even a worse situation, especially with three of them. Um, in the town, it, you know, in my opinion, it's an environmental crime and the town's going to have to um, do something about it eventually. And uh, maybe this is the year to, to make some change. I don't know. So I echo um, Wayne's concerns. And I would like to also remind the commission that this also used to occur, occur at Maple Meadow Brook. And that's we used to draw in contaminants from the Olin chemical site because the wells pump so hard. And um, this aquifer is not without its contamination. Uh, so we also run the risk of contaminating the aquifer also especially under drought conditions, because the lower the water gets, the more you draw, the farther away you draw from, and the more contaminants you can draw in. So I just want the commission to understand as an education point. Um, I'd also like to uh, ask a, just a, a couple of questions, if I may, um, about the riverfront area. Um, is the applicant saying that the, this is all inner riverfront, this project is taking place in the inner riverfront? We, we yeah we have the project listed as 100 to in the outer riverfront area okay so that's i guess that's a problem because that's not that's not the case here um when because this, this idea that that inner summer channel is considered the the mean annual high water mark to draw the inner riverfront is absolutely wrong. And I'm sure Cameron and Valerie can attest that when they were out there, because I went out there also, um, just this past week, that the water is right on the outer bank of the river. You can't even see the inner channel, the summer channel. And I have to once again remind this commission that the law says mean annual high water, not low mean water. We're not supposed to define mean annual high water based on the low, the low flow channel. It's the high flow bank that we determine mean annual high. This project is 100% completely in inner riverfront. I did talk to Mike Woods this week about it and told him, you know, I wanted to talk to him about it because I wanted to try to um, avoid another appeal on this matter. Um, because the headwater stream team takes this seriously and we, we feel like the, the commission needs to be educated on this because the brooks are being not delineated properly. And um, the Rivers Protection Act is being rendered a moot point um, because uh, the headwaters don't ha have defined banks like, um, like a major river. These are wetland streams and the banks go to the outside bank in the wintertime and the summertime. They're confined to smaller flow channels. Um, so that being said, we view this project as being completely in the inner riverfront and it's a highly sensitive area ecologically. It has been so degraded by past practices. And um, as Valerie had mentioned, uh, yes, there is a lot of invasive species there. And if it weren't for the invasive species there, there wouldn't be practically any vegetation. And so um, the invasive species that are there, they actually have a value to wildlife. 
And this project is going to really disturb a lot of that area where um, there's more than those two trees. Um, and we feel the town should be obligated to make it better and not worse, considering it's in a, in a riverfront. They already impact the brook significantly, and Martinsburg is struggling to survive biologically. Um, the town kills that brook biologically every, almost every year. Um, and it's, like I said, to me, it's an environmental crime. So I'm going to ask the commission to require at least to prevent an appeal, uh, to require at least a better planting plan than they have to restore the um, inner riparian area around the fenced in area and um, maybe a little bit farther down where there's already impacts um, existing from the prior development. Uh, to me, this is almost like a redevelopment type of thing. So I'm going to ask the applicant to do that. And I'm going to ask the commission to require more than two trees to be planted there. It's just not adequate. And there's no description of what kind of trees are going to be planted. Um, the size of the trees. I know that the commission has a policy for tree planting. But uh, this is wildlife habitat. I go there all the time. The birds nest in there. The critters use it. Um, and there's a lot of thorns and there's a lot of bittersweet, but that's their food source. And, um, and like I said, it's been degraded there for quite some time along the road, which brings me to another question. Will there be, the limit of work is not clear on this plan. Is there gonna be work inside the road? And if so, what distance from inside, from the fenced in area where the wells are down the road? So the limit of work is shown on the plans on the erosion controls and all work will be confined within that limit of work as shown by the erosion controls. Um, and if you look at, I believe plan C2, we, we do call out the tree species that will be replaced and we do call out the size and it goes above and beyond what the town of Wilmington has for a tree replacement policy. Was that how many trees, I'm sorry, how many trees are gonna be re replaced then? There will be two. The town of Wilmington requires a three to one replacement and we are doing a one to one replacement. Yeah, I mean, there's, but so when I look at that, like if you, if like the photo that uh, Valerie had shared, you know, the one big tree, uh, which is a big loss, but the one big tree um, that if you go behind where you see the well couplings are behind there, there's a whole bunch of little trees and those, those trees are gonna be gone. Uh, this is like, once again, I said, this is in a riverfront area. This is right on the banks of that river. So on the banks, uh, you take one step over and you're in the, you're in the river. The, the little trees will not be removed. The only two trees that will be removed are the two 15 inch deciduous trees. The little trees will remain. Well, when I looked at the limited work, it looked like that area was inside the limited work. It, it is not. The fence line will, uh, will abut those trees and they will maintain outside the fence line. The only thing that will be installed there are fence posts with small concrete foundations and they will not disturb. Those, those trees will not be removed. Where the, three, where the three well couplings are now, they exist. There's the three well couplings right now. You're saying the trees behind those couplings will not be removed. That's correct. Well, I mean, I've said what I said. I mean, I, I think that the township has an obligation to leave it better than what it is and not worse. Um, you know, there's a lot of brush and a lot of uh, habitat there. So, I mean, it's up to the commission. Thanks, Suzanne. Does Martha have anything to say? Uh, she was also on the, the call. Are we, are we all set with public comment? Believe so. Yeah, we we don't have any other raised hands. Anyone else? Okay. Valerie. Oh, oh. yes. Hi, is Martha. that Martha? Yes, it is. Yes, Martha. I'm I'm I am here, Don. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask. I'm sorry. I I was sort of. Uh, not at my computer. Did did the commission receive our comments from earlier today? 
the email they, comments? They did. We emailed those um, when we received them this afternoon. We emailed those to the commission. Yeah. Uh, is there something that we missed, Martha? Is that what you're you're getting at? Um, Susanna, had, Susanna had sent in an email late in the afternoon, and I was just wanting to make sure you had received it. Yes, yes, and and in her comments, um, there was um, there was a contention that we're in fact the project in fact is in the one to 200 foot zone um, that uh, sort of, I, I, wanna, I wanna create sort of bullet points so that um, you know, we, we address them uh, for the next meeting. One of them was you, you believe that, that we're, not in the, we're not in the zero to 100, but rather in the 100 to two foot, 200. Foot. No, actually, I, I, my understanding is that uh, the town was using the midstream, the summer, middle of the summer channel as the, the starting point for the inner riparian. Um, so maybe, Don, the best thing is to clarify the delineation of riverfront area. That yeah, would be helpful. That's, that's what I'm getting at. Uh, yeah. the, the, um, the tree replacements have been um, spelled out. Correct. Uh, in, yeah. And I I'm, think I'm, that, I'm less concerned about that than just, I think the, the stream team's major concern always is properly defining and delineating riverfront on every project. And, and I think it's really critical for the town, especially given that the town is so serious about planning for the future and climate change and so forth. It's, it's essential that the town and, and, and the commission's at the forefront of all of this. So to me, it's essential that the commission and the town understand how to properly delineate riverfront on all of our headwater streams. And that's why we're being pests all the time because we want you guys to understand. We need you to understand and to best protect the water resources of the community. Yes, thanks. Um, let's see, I, I wanna make sure I gather my points here. So the you know to to clarify where we're where the project actually falls, um, and I guess the thing that's really sort of the, the other big thing that's really sort of out of our hands is uh, the policy of um, the the point that Wayne brought up about the the trigger to to actually make sure that wells aren't pumping when uh, when the water level is getting too low, that doesn't that doesn't sound like something that we can do anything about. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Valerie. That that sounds like a something that someone else is going to have to to do. Some other agency in town. Is that correct? Uh, my my screen is frozen, so I'm not sure if you can hear me or not. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, yeah. perfect. Um, no, we can we can take that back and, and sort of see um, and address that comment. The project team can can look at that. Um, my understanding is that we're approved for certain flows. Yeah. Uh, can I, can I, this is Kirsten Ryan. Sorry, client filter. Sorry about the echo. You all said Valerie. I just want to make sure. Yeah, sure. Okay, Kristen. Yeah. So just what you're referring to the is the Mass DEP purview, mm -hmm. the withdrawal amounts allocation. So I would suggest that that's, that is a separate issue. 
yeah, that that was that was my thought in terms of of the installation of wells. How we use them is is really is sort of up to someone else. May I may I say, Don, though that the commission has it in your purview to protect drinking water as as part of the Wetlands Protection Act, and and I. Thank you personally for bringing that topic up this evening because the town, as I say, the town has an obligation to protect its natural resources in light of the hazard mitigation plan and the, uh, the climate change plan that's under development. And I think the commission is at the forefront of all of those because you guys have authority over our wetland resources and to some extent our drinking water resources. And, and yes, the Water and Sewer Commission has a greater responsibility on, on well withdrawals and so forth. But if the commission holds the town accountable, it will help drive that and help the community and, and regular people in town start to understand the importance of protecting our wetland resources because they protect our water resources. And as long as the town is dependent on well water, it's essential that we protect the area around the wellheads as much as possible. And so I think I give you credit tonight for asking those questions um, because the greater the withdrawals from groundwater wells, and especially those right on the banks of our headland headwater streams, uh, will result in depletion of the river flow, and as Suzanne said, have the potential to draw in contamination from farther away. So the commission has some authority to regulate some of that. You don't, you can't determine the stream flow standards per se but you have an obligation and an opportunity to protect our water resources by protecting the wetland areas that surround them all. I hope that, I hope that makes yeah. sense. I'm happy to have a conversation with anyone on the commission going forward to help, help, help could, better understand our position. Sorry. If I could also just make a comment. Certainly. So again, my name is Kirsten Ryan with Kleinfeld. I'm a project manager and a senior hydrogeologist with the firm. Um, this re project is a replacement well project. It's, there is no greater withdrawal for this project than, than anything that has been happening for, you know, already the town is well within its rights to withdraw the amount of water that they're proposing to, and it's no change from the existing. Um, I would also mention that through a separate effort we have done some modeling and reviewed USGS modeling of the Ipswich River Basin and some of the assertions that wells such as this are pumping the river dry are actually unfounded. Um, so I don't believe there is any direct evidence indicating that these wells are harming the brook right there in, in the research that we've done. So that's the comment I would make. Respectfully, could I respond to that? That assertion is absolutely false, and I'll, I'll leave it at that. We've documented both in 2020 and 2016, this brook flowing backwards to this well until the brook grows dry. What um, the, the engineer from Kleinfelder is talking about is large scale overall water balance, but at low flows, that study that she's referring did not address low flows in any regard. And we have analytical data that proves that these wells are what caused the brook to go dry. It's not a big issue in the grand scheme in the whole water balance, but at severe low flows, there's nothing in nature that makes brooks go backwards to a well until it then goes dry. And um, so I would just respectfully um, disagree um, and that study that is being referred to did not address this particular issue. Thanks. Um, to to sort of get back onto the the, the uh, assertion that the the riverfront is is um, not being shown correctly. Uh, does the applicant have 
Um, is everyone comfortable with the plans as submitted or do you want to continue this till the next hearing, make absolutely sure, sure that uh, the riverfront is delineated um, accurately? Um, I think address the, um, I guess the, 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 the trees and stuff are, are, are all taken care of. There were, there were no other big things that I remember. The contention that the riverfront is, is inaccurate seems to be the biggest contention. So. Don, I would, I would add that it, it, if we do change that riverfront area designation on the plans and on the application to, to, there's nothing about our proposed work that will change. Um, okay, but but it would it would be it would be the accurate riverfront if you did have if you did feel you had to change it. Um, correct. Even if, if we you, did feel we had to change it, the, the work thing. would the work would still remain the same, and and the tree yeah, replacement right. would still remain the same, and yes. the, the scope okay. of work would be the same. Yeah. Okay. But again, for good. Uh, Valerie, was there was there anything that um, you and Cameron were were thinking of doing, sort of between now and the next meeting, if we if we continued this? Um, yeah, we had um, talked to Joe about um, mentioned kind of pulling some of those erosion controls and fence. Um, back where they could, if they could. Um, it is, um, I would actually recommend if the commissioners could go out to the site, that would be really helpful. Um, when Shea is open, you can drive down the road um, and kind of see the, the spot for yourself where, um, where the fencing is proposed and the, um, the tree removal. Um, it's really helpful to see um, the scale of things. Um, and I think you know, after going out there, I'm looking at the plan, it looks like maybe they could pull some things kind of tighter going out there. I'm not sure that that's possible, but um, we asked them to look at that to see if they could do anything um, in that respect. And I think there were some questions about um, adding some restoration. Um, you know, maybe they could add some more plantings. I'm not sure. It's, it's actually kind of, again, I would, I would encourage you all to go out there to take a look. Um, it, okay. it does help. Um, we don't have any sort of draft order or anything prepared tonight. So um, action tonight, I don't think would be appropriate. Okay, good. And, and I get the impression that on something of this size and importance, the, the applicant would be willing to deal in terms of uh, plantings or restoration or, or things like that. That's fairly minor in, in terms of the, the, the cost of the whole project. So. Um, why don't I then um, ask for a motion to continue this hearing for the Salem Street Wellfields to the June, give me a date, please. I believe it's June, let me see the June 2nd. 2nd. No, 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 I'm, yeah, June 2nd, June sorry. 2nd, yeah. Good. Till the June second meeting. Any anyone any takers? So moved. Right. Thank you, Laura. Uh, second. Second. Thank you, Vinny. Uh, how do you vote, Laura? Yes. Uh, Alex. Yes. Ron. Yes. Vinny. Yes. I vote yes. So we'll see you again on the second. Thanks for your okay. time. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, everyone. Yep. Good night. Good night. Okay. We have um, a public hearing for a notice of intent for the culvert replacing place and replacement on Middlesex Ave, Leversbrook at Middlesex Ave. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the commission. Uh, Paula Mooney, town engineer here on behalf of the Department of Public Works um, for a notice intent filing for culvert replacement, um, Lubbers Brook under Route 62, Middlesex Ave. Uh, before I get started here, I wanna introduce uh, the design team. The town hired TEC to design the culvert replacement um, and to prepare the notice of intent. TEC has done a lot of infrastructure public infrastructure projects in town and certainly throughout the Commonwealth. Um, so the lead presenters here tonight will be Bob uh, Nicoli from TEC, structural engineer, and Peter Ellison from also uh, engineer with TEC. Um, TEC hired Hancock as their sub consultant to do the resource area delineation um, and to do survey work. You probably remember Hancock, they were the lead consultant for the Princeton Properties um, project, which is right in this area, uh, adjoining the project site. Now the town also hired LEC as an independent third party peer review of the resource area delineation and notice of intent as a whole. Um, and Rich Kirby, I believe is going to attend tonight um, and to answer any questions the commission may have as well. Um, before I kind of pass the um, floor over here to TEC, just want to give you a quick project background um, and, um, and discuss the funding mechanism here. So the, the, this project is funded through a MassWorks grant. Uh, MassWorks grant is a it's a public private partnership where public infrastructure is funded to facilitate multifamily, uh, private multifamily home construction. So the catalyst in this case for the grant was the uh, Princeton properties project. The town was granted $2.89 million for that, um, um, for that application where $1.23 million will be allocated um, to this culvert. I could share my screen, um, that's okay. Sure. I wanna bring up a quick project locus. I'm sure we all know the area, but um, just in case. So this is Route 62 here, here's Lover's Brook. Um, it's between, here's where Lover's Brook crosses under. Um, it's between uh, Jefferson Road here and North Street. Um, I, I think we all know this this area pretty well. It's a heavily traveled route. It's um, about a half a mile from Route 93 uh, on ramps, kind of to the northeast here, um, and also provides access to a lot of businesses and residences in the area, as well as um, the commuter rail station, too, um, which is here. Uh, one thing I want to point out to that. This corridor is the fastest and kind of most direct route for our police, fire, and emergency response to access North Wilmington. Um, our fire station is west of here, which I'm sure you all, all know. Um, it's uh, right off of Adelaide Street, our police and fire station, our public safety building. And I bring that up for two reasons. Um, first, we um, like kind of had had to consider that as a design objective um, in terms of we couldn't trot out a, a culvert replacement design here that had a prolonged construction schedule of like six to nine months, let's say, or, or beyond, um, because we just couldn't sustain that level of interruption um, along this, this roadway corridor. And the second reason why I bring that up is uh, the existing culvert really is on borrowed time. Um, the, the culvert is failing. The existing culvert is failing. Um, it's a double barrel. I'm gonna share a, can you see this plan here um, that I just brought up? This is the original MassDOT plan from 1960. It's, this is the section in here of what it kind of consists of. It's a double barrel CMP arch pipe culvert. Um, 
Again, it was uh, built in 1960. The, um, uh, this is the last underwater inspection we got from MassDOT in February of 2021, if you all can see that now. This is, th this is where it classifies the condition of the culverts. This number three indicates it's in serious condition. This SP indicates it's in severe and to prioritize um, replacement. So what they're noting is that there's um, major deficiencies and we're at, in some sections, 100% section loss. So kind of to speak plainly about that, um, they are identifying holes along the top of this pipe, uh, both pipes, um, and we're starting to lose roadway base um, through those holes. Now I took a look at the mass stop profile where they have it stationed. Um, and I looked at where kind of the largest hole was in the westerly um, culvert barrel. And actually you can start to notice a dip in the roadway there. Um, so it kind of goes without saying, I think the time for action is now. Um, best case without action, I guess, the best case would be a sinkhole kind of forms right above that hole. Uh, we played it to buy us some time to figure out how to repair this. Um, worst case, uh, it could be catastrophic. We could lose the roadway, um, which obviously I don't think anyone wants that to happen. Uh, so our current schedule is to um, permanent this project now, the spring and early summer. Um, we, our permitting schedule is of course with you folks, the Conservation Commission um, for the notice of intent. We also have chapter 85 mass dot license permit to acquire um, and the Army Corps of Engineers as well. We look to um, then have um, our procurement documents um, formulated and, and compiled in August. And our hope is to then go to construction in the fall. Um, this project will undoubtedly, when it, a shovel eventually does go into the ground, um, it will have major impacts to traffic in the area. Uh, we are currently working with police and fire. So it's a little premature, but just so you all know, we're looking at probably a three to five week full closure um, of Middlesex Ave to construct this culvert. Um, we'll of course have to continue our discussions with police and fire. We'll have to start having discussions with the school department um, and, and obviously town officials. We'll have um, an, a very aggressive notification campaign um, to all the residences and businesses. So everyone has time to plan for that for, for when it does happen. Um, we just want to kind of get a better idea of when it will happen, like when we will actually go to start to construction before we start um, kind of uh, finalizing uh, those plans, but they have started. And um, lastly, I just want to um, say we're not looking for a vote from the commission tonight, of course, it's too large of a project um, to be so uh, brazen, really. Uh, we, we do recognize though, too, that there are errors in the report, uh, in the narrative, and there was an error on the plan with the um, resource delineation shown. Uh, TEC is going to address both of those um, uh, in their presentation tonight. Um, you know, and we, we're also going to take this time to um, you know, get feedback from, of course, uh, the commission, Headwater Stream team, Ipswich River Watershed Association. Um, we received comments from the Headwater Stream team in writing, and um, we also received a comment letter from um, LEC from Rich Kirby. So, but we got, we got the headwater stream team letter earlier than, uh, LECs, but we haven't had quite a chance to like digest all the comments and, and respond to them, but we will be addressing all comments and hopefully, um, for 
the June hearing, um, we'll have a complete package with um, all the plan revisions made, report revisions made, and, um, and, and comments um, addressed for a discussion at that point. So without further ado, um, I will pass the uh, microphone now over to uh, Mr. Nicoli from TEC. Thank you. I had to stop sharing, right? Yep, because I'm going to share my screen here. Right. I think uh, I think you got it. All right. Uh, let me know when everybody can see my screen. Yes. All right. Also, um, let me start off with a quick apology. I have a five week old here at home and we've entered witching hour. So you may hear crying in the background. I apologize. Um, thank you to the uh, members of the commission uh, for meeting with us tonight so we can talk about this important project. Uh, as Paul mentioned, it's uh, Middlesex Avenue over the Lubbers Brook. Um, just showing a, a photo here of the existing head wall. Uh, this is on the south side, uh, built in 1960. Um, and uh, just to give uh, another quick introduction, um, my name is Bob Nikolai, and uh, I'm the structural engineer on the project. Um, and then speaking after me will be uh, Peter Ellison uh, from TEC as well, who handles our uh, wetlands and permitting. Uh, just to give uh, an overview of the project, I know Paul already gave one and this may be a rehash, but uh, just kind of showing how centrally located this project is between the commuter rail station and between I-93. Um, and with the horizontal curve there right at North Street and uh, the horizontal curve just past the uh, commuter rail station. Uh, these horizontal curves, you know, do present a design constraint. Uh, when we're working on this project, but uh, I will talk about that a little bit later. I just, this slide really wanted to drive home the importance of the location uh, in regards to uh, the town of Wilmington. Uh, and I'll, I'll breeze through this too, because Paul already mentioned it, but um, you know, the existing structure to uh, twin barrel culverts and the town has been receiving concerning uh, inspection reports from on these uh, culverts for some time. Again, it sounds like rehash, but this is, you know, very critical. Um, oftentimes what we see with these culverts is they don't decay linearly. They decay exponentially. So when the corrosion really starts to get bad, it can really accelerate. Um, so what we've really seen in the past few years is the deterioration of these culverts. And, and Paul said it well, talking about the, the gravel and sand that's currently coming through the culverts into the brook. Uh, and that's going to continue over time if we don't act. Uh, just another uh, quick photo showing this is uh, the north side, um, uh, looking at the head walls. And you see there's not a lot of headroom there between the uh, top of the stream and the roadway surface. Uh, that lack of clearance is kind of another big constraint for this project. Um, how we go about designing the replacement structure for this. Again, we've seen this before, but uh, just kind of reiterating the severe major deficiencies that are present in the pipe, 100% um, section loss, uh, the loss of uh, substrate material, and the fact that they're now monitor, uh, MassDOT's currently monitoring the SAG in this culvert. So they're, you know, actively monitoring, wa watching it, you know, start to deform a little bit. So when we started out with this, you know, what were kind of the project goals? Uh, obviously, first and foremost, uh, replace the corrugated metal structures. That's kind of the key to the, the whole project. Um, also, again, with the you know, not only the police fire uh, EMTs in this area, but just everyday traffic of people going to 93 and going to the commuter rail station. Um, try to eliminate that to the greatest extent possible uh, for public safety. Uh, also improve the traffic safety features at the crossing and improve the resiliency of the structure for uh, future, you know, storm level events. 
and uh, also, of course, you know, minimize the uh, impacts to resource areas to the greatest extent practical. Again, I talked a little bit about project constraints, but it is important to see kind of all these aspects to the project. Um, there's a really severe skew angle here. Um, the stream cuts through underneath at about a 45 degree angle. Uh, that really limits what we can do in terms of replacement alternatives. Um, there are limits to um, the skew of um, what you could do with like say a, a precast concrete box cauldron. Um, you know, there's limits to how those footings fit into the, the superstructure. Uh, in addition, I kind of mentioned this a little bit, but the, the surrounding houses, businesses and resource areas uh, really make raising the roadway profile kind of uh, not feasible. Uh, in addition to that, you have the horizontal curves at each end. So if you raise the profile, you're going to be affecting those curves. Uh, you have the, um, the railroad tracks. I mean, trying to get uh, something done like this with MBTA, you know, will be a real, real long process. Um, in addition, you have intersections at North Street and Jefferson Road. Uh, any raise of the profile, you're going to have to regrade those entire intersections. And all this doesn't even talk about, you know, your slope impacts you would have to the resource areas from raising the profile. Um, so also the width of the roadway and the presence of the obstructions. Uh, one of the first things we looked at was doing this project in two phases. Um, closing half the road, um, demoing half the culverts, installing sheeting so to support the road in place. Um, but what we did was we did a ground penetrating radar survey of the area and found several boulder-like obstructions below the grade uh, around these culverts. So that makes driving sheeting impossible. Uh, can't drive those through boulders. And that's just going to cause more construction delays, more costs, uh, and more headaches uh, for the traveling public. Uh, in addition, uh, the presence of utilities also kind of limit the alternatives we can do here. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, currently, there's a Verizon duck bank uh, underneath the uh, north sidewalk. There's 12 four-inch conduits that run underneath the existing culvert. Um, the plan is to keep those more or less in place, maybe lower them down a little bit. Um, there's a national grid gas line beneath the north shoulder. Uh, we'll be looking to uh, you know, replace that as part of this. Uh, there's a water main on the south side of the uh, bridge uh, beneath the stream. Uh, there will be future uh, sewer infrastructure that will run uh, over top of the culvert. Um, when I say under the, that should actually read under the road and above the culvert. Um, and there's also um, uh, drainage um, um, infrastructure within this area. Um, so like I mentioned, the, with all these constraints, uh, we kind of went to the drawing board and tried to figure out how we could replace this quickly um, and um, also try to meet the uh, Mass Massachusetts stream crossing standards to the greatest extent practical uh, was really our goal here. Uh, so the proposed option came back as a, uh, an open bottom aluminum arch uh, resting on precast concrete footings. Um, the rise of the new culvert will roughly match the rise of the existing barrels. And this was something we did have a typo in our report um, we called the rise seven foot nine inches. Um, that's the size of the culvert when it gets to the site. And then you embed that two feet below the stream bed. So that's where that five foot nine, seven foot nine um, disconnect was. Um, and again, that the rise will roughly match it due to the uh, roadway profile and what raising that will do uh, to the project. Uh, the hydraulic opening still, even with this match rise, will increase by 56%. Um, again, this is just a, a quick photo of kind of 
what it would look like. Um, this doesn't have the same span and rise as our culvert, but this is uh, similar to what our replacement structure would look like. Um, just to kind of breeze over the hydraulic analysis here a little bit, uh, the hydraulic engineer uh, the, uh, is not on the call tonight, but um, from his analysis, you can see that, you know, the, um, this, the existing culvert from a hydraulic perspective can actually handle all the flows uh, that it's up against. Obviously not from a ecological stream crossing standards perspective, but from a hydrological perspective, it can. So this isn't acting, this current culvert isn't acting as a limiting uh, culvert to anything downstream. Um, so you can see that, you know, both the existing culvert and the new culvert will pass the 25 year storm, um, which is the design storm for this um, uh, roadway classification. Uh, it needs to pass the 25 year design storm, which it does. Uh, just looking a little bit at the Massachusetts stream crossing standards. Again, we tried to match this to the greatest extent practical. Uh, that dry passage and 1.2 bank full width uh, due to the headroom here, the, the profile and the wide banks uh, wasn't really something that was, we were able to meet in a practical manner. Um, you know, the contact uh, structure that we're proposing does provide an open bottom corrugated metal culvert. Uh, it's embedded the, uh, you know, proper amount. Uh, it provides an openish ratio greater than the general standard. Uh, it does, we will do our best to provide something resembling a natural stream bottom. Uh, it's not going to be, it's not a four-sided culvert, so there's no concrete bottom to it. Um, and the water depth and velocity are comparable to the natural channel. And with that, I'm gonna kick it over to Pete, uh, who can talk a little bit more uh, about some of the, uh, the wetlands and resource areas. Thanks, Bob. Uh, good evening, members of the commission. My name is Peter Ellison with TEC. Um, what I'd like to do is just run through the resource areas that are present at the culvert. Um, and within the, the limits of the project, uh, highlights some of the impacts that are proposed as part of this project, and then uh, turn it back over to the commission and uh, answer any questions you might have. Um, so starting out, um, there are four areas of bordering vegetated wetlands, BVW. Uh, in the Northwest quadrant of the culvert is the A-series BVW. Um, and I understand that this, this A-series line was recently approved by the commission uh, in their uh, February or, or late January uh, hearing as part of the neighboring uh, housing project. In the Northeast quadrant is the B-series BVW. In the Southeast quadrant is the C-series BVW. And in the Southwest quadrant is the D-series BVW. Um, and towards the outer skirts of the page, uh, you can see the 100 foot buffer zone that we've sketched in. Um, and really one point I wanted to get across with this, with this graphic is to show the commission that um, the full limits of our project is within the buffer zone. Um, just with the nature of the work being a culvert replacement, we're going to be working very closely to the resource areas. And um, as I get into in a few slides, there will be some uh, temporary and permanent impacts proposed as part of this project. Uh, on the next slide, um, I will go over the, um, the bank or the mean annual high water line delineation and uh, the associated riverfront areas. Um, and Paul Looney touched on this earlier, but um, I do wanna apologize to the commission. We made a mistake in the way that we showed the bank or mean annual high water line in the Northwest quadrant. Um, what you see on this graphic here is um, the correct delineation. This is the delineation that was approved by your commission um, in the order of conditions for the, uh, for the housing project that was issued in February. Um, similar to the BBW, there are kind of four distinct quadrants, Northwest, Northeast, Southeast, and, and Southwest. Uh, and then towards the outside of the page, you can see the 
the inner 100 foot um, inner riparian zone, inner riverfront area, and then the outs the outer 200 foot riverfront area. Um, and again, you know, the full limits of our project are within the riverfront area. Um, and and uh, as I get into on the next slide, um, there will be impacts proposed to not only the riverfront area, but also um, to the banks associated with it. Um, Bob, you can just go to the next slide, please. Oh, I did. Uh, the Do you want the one, the combo slide? Yeah, that, that's fine. I think I think okay. uh, I've spent enough time on this, on the uh, okay. research areas. Okay. So uh, just real quickly, I'll highlight um, from a top-down view what we're proposing. Again, I think Bob spent um, some time highlighting the culvert structure itself. Um, the full limits of the project, it stretches about 250 feet. Um, and within those limits, we'll be installing um, sewer infrastructure, including gravity and force main, um, new drainage infrastructure with deep sump and hooded catch basins to um, provide a slight improvement in, in stormwater collection and treatment in the area. Um, and undoubtedly, there will be other utilities as well, um, water line, uh, gas, I think it will be cut and capped, and then uh, underground electrical and um, telecommunications as well. Um, at the end of the day, the, there will be about a 250 foot stretch of new paving um, as part of the project, as well as uh, new concrete sidewalks throughout the limits um, and uh, guardrail and bridge rail across um, that will provide a safety improvement over current conditions. Uh, on the next side, slide, I'll start to get into the impacts being proposed, um, starting out with just the temporary impacts. Um, the green lines in the four quadrants of the culvert are the temporary bank impacts, um, meaning that these banks will be temporary impa temporarily impacted during construction um, of the new culvert, but will at the end of the day be put back in their current location. Um, there will also be temporary impacts to bordering vegetated wetlands in the southeast quadrant shown in red here, um, totaling 265 square feet. Uh, and those impacts are mainly due to the um, dewatering system that will be proposed um, in order to complete the construction. And finally, uh, temporary impacts to land underwater totaling 2,635 square feet. Um, and as you can see in blue here, it essentially stretches um, from bank to bank within the river uh, between the sandbags that will be used um, and put in place to dewater this area while the culvert is being constructed. Um, one thing I do want to point out here is we're showing uh, temporary sheeting in the, in the center of the roadway in this graphic. Um, Paul Looney touched on this earlier, but we, we are in discussion and, and kind of planning a full shutdown on the road. So if that's the case, these plans would be revised and that temporary sheeting would be removed in that location. Um, on the next slide, I'll talk about the permanent impacts proposed. There are 45 square feet of permanent impacts to BVW proposed shown in green here. Uh, these are just kind of at the limits of the banks and the reason for these impacts is because we're constructing new um, riprap stabilized slope uh, and slopes in that location and the grading just happens to cross over slightly into the BVWs. Um, and the reason that the slopes will be rip wrapped is um, as, as a form of scour protection um, for long term, you know, stability of this of the slopes. So in order to mitigate um, the impacts, we're proposing um, a wetland replication area uh, totaling 100 square feet, which will provide just over a two to one wetland replication ratio. Um, and I guess one thing I'll point out, uh, just reading through LEC's letter, and I did see Rich Kirby on the call tonight, um, there will be further details um, provided um, after reading through Rich's letter, we'll, we'll be providing more detail on the replication area and the temporary impacts and construction of the stream bed going forward. Um, you know, we received those comments today, so we're in the process of, of digesting and fully understanding those comments, um, as well as the comments received from the other project stakeholders 
that we'll you know work on and and hope to address moving forward. Um, so with that being said, I would be happy to turn it back to the commission and answer any questions. Or um, before that, Mr. Chairman, may I just add one quick item? I think I, I think I saw you say yes. Um, so what I didn't mention was this MassWorks about the MassWorks grant. There are three parts to the MassWorks grant. There's the culvert replacement for the one point two three million dollars, but also making up that two point eight nine million dollars is a sewer extension project, um, as well as roadway improvements. Um, the sewer extension project. I'm going to share my screen again, if that's okay. The sewer extension project runs from uh, Jefferson Road um, northeasterly to uh, this intersection of High Street and Middlesex Ave, and then runs kind of off the page here to um, Salem Street, where our gravity um, our gravity line currently exists that we'll be tying into. Uh, the roadway improvements proposed uh, pretty minor in nature, mainly just restriping um, in this corridor here. There's no widening or anything like that or increase in impervious area, at least that I'm aware of. Um, there's also some um, improvements to the traffic lights here at um, uh, Middlesex and High, High Street. I think just adding some more um, up to code back plates um, on the signal heads. And with that, um, yeah, we could, uh, happy to, uh, thank you for all your time and, and we're happy to answer any questions the commission may have. Yeah, the, it's nine o'clock, the clock was, Cameron away again. Um, so Cameron, Valerie, do you want to start? Yeah, sure. Um, so Mr. Chairman, um, we, um, we were proactive and, um, and um, obtained the services of LEC um, to get um, sort of a, a view of, of the project and the delineation. Um, Rich Kirby, who you're familiar with um, from the, um, the development project um, was um, kind enough to go out there and take a look for us and provided um, some feedback on the delineation and feedback on the NOI. Um, that report was submitted this afternoon. You probably haven't had a, a chance to go over the whole thing, um, but he is here tonight to, um, to speak to that and to uh, advise the commission um, on that. Okay, Rich. You have some slides? Sure. sure. Thanks. Thanks, Valerie, members. Um, yes, we were retained to evaluate the Bank Manual High Water Line associated with Lovers Brook, north and south of the proposed crossing, and then to review the notice of intent application as well. Uh, we did prepare a report that I finished this afternoon. It's been a busy couple of weeks, that's for sure. Uh, apologies, I couldn't get it to you sooner. I know that can be frustrating to receive uh, review comments the afternoon of the, of the hearing. Um, but the, uh, the mean annual high water delineation, we'll start with that. Um, the, the, I reviewed the northwest, sorry, excuse me, northeast, southwest, and southeast quadrants, if you will, uh, because the northwest quadrant uh, had been reviewed and approved by the commission as part of the Jefferson Avenue housing uh, project. So um, on the north, uh, northeast side, relatively straightforward. Um, I think I had one relatively minor flag change on the northeast side. On the southeast side, a uh, little bit more of a, of a change, uh, probably between five and, and 10 feet. Uh, and that was largely due to the presence of bankful indicators beyond the flags that we observed when we were out there. Now, if the commission recalls, during the Lovers Brook Mean Annual High Water discussion for the Jefferson Avenue project, we relied on our observations of bankful indicators or, or absence of bankful indicators, and also relied on the um, predicted bankful dimensions that were, uh, that were provided by USGS stream stats and, uh, and by uh, the literature by Leopold. 
And based on that uh, roughly five square mile watershed area, we had an anticipated bank fill dimension of roughly, you know, 23.9 feet, I think it was in width, uh, with, you know, one and a half foot uh, depth. And so because of that, and the channel on the north side of the, uh, of the crossing um, is within those parameters, um, we've, you know, it, it, that is a, a, another corroborating indicator, along with the absence of bankful indicators beyond the main channel and the presence of bankful indicators within the main channel, that the uh, delineation along the main channel is accurate on the north side. On the south side, however, the primary channel through which the water flows narrows compared to the north side. It gets down to be about probably about 15 feet wide when it exits the uh, when it exits the culverts, and as such, that channel capacity is inadequate, uh, or at least the um, the prediction uh, models suggest that that channel is inadequate to contain bankful flow. Um, and accordingly, we did observe bankful indicators beyond that uh, relatively narrow channel, which caused the flag revisions that we made in the field. Um, those flag revisions are numbered in the report. Now on the southeast side, excuse me, southwest side, um, there is the existing conditions plan and then there was that exhibit that, um, that uh, Hancock, I believe it was, sent to us to reconcile the flag changes on the Northwest side, what was originally flagged versus what was eventually approved by the commission in the order of conditions for the Jefferson Ave housing project. But there is a discrepancy on the Southwest side as well, the Southwest quadrant. So I just wanna make sure that the next plan iteration reconciles that, uh, that difference. The flag locations in the field on the southwest side look uh, accurate to me, but the plans and the uh, exhibit were a little bit off. Uh, so that really concludes the mean annual high water evaluation. I did review the BVW delineation as well, and there was one flag on the southeast side right up against the culvert that I thought should be moved up a few feet to encapsulate an area that had some standing water, wetland plants, and wetland soils. The letter report goes through the, uh, the um, bankful indicators that we observed and the watershed analysis and the recommended flag changes. Um, we also reviewed the notice of intent application and provided some preliminary uh, review comments. I know some of them were addressed in the, uh, in the presentation by TEC, which was very thorough and informative. Uh, I recommend that you submit that um, PowerPoint presentation as part of the record. Um, but ultimately, you know, the compliance with the Massachusetts Stream Crossing Standards to the maximum extent uh, practicable is something that the Commission needs to decide. It's a discretionary call on the Commission's part. Um, I think they make a pretty good um, argument given the design limitations, the lack of significant cover between the top of the culvert and the roadway where all those utilities have to go. Um, maintaining the roadway, roadway profile and the context of the surrounding development, the cost, the timing, uh, and the importance of the roadway and the, and the uh, location in town. Um, and of course, appreciate the um, commitment to restoring the BVW land underwater and bank. Uh, I think it would be good to get a little bit more detail on the plan and perhaps in a narrative form that describes how those resource areas will be restored, um, specifically planting, uh, soil specifications, erosion control, um, things like that. <clears throat> uh, I think it would be good to have a dewatering detail uh, on the plan, I know a lot of times um, project design teams sort of rely on the project contractor to come up with a dewatering detail. Um, I think it would be good for the commission to have some information there, at least some different options about what dewatering may look like, even if it is ultimately, ultimately left to the contractor. And perhaps if that's the case, a special condition requiring the contractor to submit a detailed dewatering plan prior to the start of work. 
the notice of intent application was silent, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, on um, the extent of bordering land subject to flooding on the property and whether or not the project would have any impact on BLSF. If there is impact, whether it be temporary or permanent, uh, it'd be good to know what those numbers are and, and what restorative efforts and or compensatory flood storage are pr proposed to offset those impacts. And lastly, um, while I'm sure the project um, can be designed and, and you're probably most of the way there uh, to meet the riverfront area performance standards, I think it would be good to go through those performance standards and demonstrate compliance with them. Uh, this is a redevelopment project because the riverfront area you're altering is previously developed and most of it is degraded riverfront area. That's paved areas, areas lacking topsoil, um, gravel areas, et cetera. And so compliance with the performance standards at 1058, four and five, um, and how then showing specifically how the project results in an improvement to the riverfront area compared to existing conditions would be good. <clears throat> so that, that really sums up our, uh, our review thus far. Um, happy to get into uh, further details with the commission or the applicant, um, if you like. But at this time, I'll, I'll turn it back over to the commission. Ellery, were you, uh, uh, you passed it over to Rich. Uh, was there more that you or Cameron were going to add? I don't think so. Um, I think Rich covered it all. Um, we had some, some thoughts about the, the replication area. Uh, more detail on that would be good. Um, possibly looking at different locations um, and um, the shape of that area. Um, just kind of getting more detailed with, with all of that. But I think Rich covered everything that, that we had. Okay, thanks. Uh, for commissioners, Vinny, how about your questions, comments? Yeah, I, uh, uh, damming up the, uh, the, the brook, is that going to affect any of the residential properties uh, on that side? Uh, so what we would do there is you, you would dam up the brook. Yes, you put in sandbags, but you'd also have going through those sandbags two temporary uh, corrugated plastic um, uh, pipes that would carry the water through the construction zone. So we could dewater, still put down our footings while the, the water kept moving through, just not using the full brook, just using the, the flow pipes that we'd put in temporarily. Yeah, but what I'm getting at is uh, if the water starts accumulating on that side, will that affect any of the residential properties on Salem Street? Um, we, we can look at that. Um, yeah. I think we, we do, uh, when we typically put some sort of a, a water uh, control water plan, we always, you know, make sure that, you know, we're monitoring the elevation of the brook. Uh, so that you aren't inundating any local properties. I mean, some of those properties do get flooded out with that brook. Sure. We'll, uh, you know, make sure that there's some sort of uh, control in place. That, that, that's all I had. Okay. Uh, Laura. I don't have any comments. Okay. Ron. I'm assuming we're looking to continue till at least June, so I can I can wait until then to to review the next product. So you had nothing in, nothing in, in between. Okay. Um, Alex. Not for today. I'm sorry. You said nothing. No. Nope. No. Nope. Okay. Um, Yeah, uh, the the um, it's a small thing, but in the O and M plan, you're you're uh, you're referring to the town of Holden. Sorry, that's a typo. We will change that. Yeah. Okay. Um, but I'm okay with with everything I've heard so far. So. Um, 
we can open it up to comments from the public now. Great, Mr. Chairman, we have um, two hands raised, um, one from Wayne Castingway and one from Suzanne. Okay, Wayne. Thank you again, commission members. Wayne Castingway, if you're a watershed association. We definitely support improving the crossing at this location. Um, and we look forward to working with the town on many more future crossing projects. The only question I would add, um, putting aside the riverfront delineation is we really looked at all the site constraints and, and totally concur that this is a, a really tough site, particularly the skew angle constraint that really limits our options here. That said, um, we do feel that the compliance with the stream crossing standards is pretty far off from what's desired. And particularly with the span width and the lack of a bank through the pipe, which is um, the desired situation. I know on the upstream side, the span is only about half the width of that um, stream upstream. And I would ask that um, the engineers and TC does a great job. I know, you know, look, look at maybe thinking outside the box a little bit and maybe thinking about some design constraints that could particularly allow for the wildlife passage. As I'm sure you local folks know, this is a pretty high mortality site. Rear Accord is the primary travel routes for wildlife. Maybe thinking about some, maybe some dry culverts, um, you know, maybe opening up the span a little bit and getting some more boarding land subject to flooding and riparian zone redevelopment credits. Um, so just some, some unique design features like that could, could get you much closer to the standards. And I would ask you to consider that. And I'd finally like to end with just a revisitation of the mean annual high water delineation we haven't looked at this site to great detail, although I know there's quite a controversy. And these streams, these headwater streams, these flat water streams, we call them, or low gradient streams are a really unique animal. And I would just like to reiterate the conversation with regard to the Salem Street Wall project earlier. I think it would be great for the commission and all of us to really um, think about that issue in these very unique sites. Despite what the modeling says, I like to use my eyes. And a lot of these streams, particularly Lover's Brook, Martinsburg, which we talked about earlier, the high water line is above the delineated high water bank that we see from half the year in many cases. And when your water level is half the year over the delineated mean high water line, you know, something's wrong. <laughs> and that's the case in this location. It certainly is the case in Martinsbrook that we talked about earlier. So I would just point that out that it would really behoove all of us, I think, to really talk about these unique animals, which are these highly impacted low gradient streams that have a downstream restriction. And the summer bank or low water bank, which is often delineated um, is, is really missing the mean high water mark in, in a lot of instances. And um, I would just like to reiterate that and again, suggest that the commission, and we'd be happy to be part of that, think about that issue long-term in these streams. Thank you. Um, you know, there's one thing that just came to mind before I, I jump over to the next uh, public comment, and, and that is: is there any um, is there anything that uh, goes into the mix for um, resilience in terms of, of changes in climate? You know, do you do you sort of look ahead? You know, the the culvert is going to last for quite a while. Do you, you know, is there is there any looking into the crystal ball saying that we expect? some of these wetland systems to be different in a way that we can sort of kind of predict? And uh, will that help in any of the design decisions? That's, that's what I had forgotten to say before. So I'll go on to Suzanne. <clears throat> Good 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so, I mean, as you know, uh, the Headwater Stream team strongly disagrees with the mean annual high watermark. I mean, actually, I was encouraged when I went out there and I saw where some of the new flags were. And I said, oh, it looks like, you know, maybe they're finally getting it. And then um, now today at the meeting and I, I see how they've delineated the channel way down as, you know, it was delineated, which is under appeal. Um, that line is under appeal. I have no idea what DEP is going to say about that line. I don't know. Maybe the, every, somebody else has insight. Um, but that, that is not a real line yet. It, it's actually not an approved line until it goes through the process. And then there's a process after the DEP um, approval or denial. So that actually is not a real line. Um, and, you know, HST knows that this culvert needs replacement and we actually support the town in that also. Um, and we would hate to have to also appeal this based on that line. And um, the, to be using stream stats um, is really inappropriate. Um, and there are provisions that under certain circumstances that you can use stream stats. Um, but to use them for a wetland stream is really inappropriate. And I will supply in comments after this meeting, I will supply the commission, I've done it once, I'll do it again, with a link to the USGS um, documents. And it states in there, the equations may not be applicable where streams flow through extensive wetlands. There's other things about flowing through um, urbanized settings, but that's the big one there. The equations may not be applicable where streams flow through extensive wetlands. So to use those stream stats here is really inappropriate. Um, you have to go out there and you have to look at it physically. I've supplied photos now, again, once again to the commission, and for six months now, the water is over, over the the delineated um, mean annual high water, the so-called bank that you can't see. There is no bank there, you can't see it. Um, it. It's been underwater now, quite a bit of water for six months and it looks like we're gonna go even farther. And I've, I've supplied those, those photos to, to the commission. So then I ask inside the report, it states um, that, um, let me see if I can just pull it up here, uh, that, this doesn't meet standard. I believe it's number three to 1.2 um, bankful width of the river. And when I look at the uh, delineated, um, you know, river, it shows that you could actually, if that delineation is correct, according to the, the, the aerial photo that they showed, then you should be able to meet the 1.2 bankful. But then in comments in, in the document, um, TEC claims that you could never accommodate bankful because it's too wide. And just so the commission understands, bankful is the edge of bankful is mean annual high water. It's kind of like a coterminous. It's like they mean basically the same thing. So, um, so I'd like to, um, and HST has put that in, in the comments and we'd like to have that addressed um, because that the delineation that they presented to the commission is not the same as what they say in their comments that bankful was so wide you could not accommodate it through this culvert. So you can't have it both ways. You can't say it's too wide so we can't accommodate it and then put it on a map then when it looks like it's maybe 18 feet when you're, uh, you, when you're um, proposing to have a 27 foot culvert. So there's a contradiction there. Um, uh, and, you know, we'll, we'll expand on that a little bit more in, in further comments after the, um, the presentation today. Um, I'm not going to go through all our comments. I hope the commission, you know, it's getting late and I don't want to take up too much time on this. Um, but I hope the commission does go through um, what we submitted to them because we do think that we have some valid concerns about, you know, natural bottom. Um, using riprap on a bank is inappropriate when there's other uh, materials that you can use. Uh, when we worked with the town on the um, baseball field and the football field behind the high school, um, they used a different type of material than um, riprap or um, railroad ties to, to maintain that bank. Um, so there's other creative things that they can do. 
Um, I also asked, there's, a, there's some type of discharge that goes into Lovers Brook from Route 62 or somewhere, it's hard to say, at um, stake BA401, and it's created a real scour. Um, and I have photos of that, and I actually meant to put a photo into our comments, but I did um, make comment that there's a discharge there. And we, I don't know where it's coming from, and it's actually a discharge even when it's not raining or anything. There's water flowing through this area. And uh, I think it might be important to figure out what it is and how it's related to Lubbersbrook or related to the road. Um, oh, what was the other, um, there was something else. Um, oh, the sewer line. Uh, it's not clear to me why the sewer line is not technically part of this project. Um, I, it's, I had a problem understanding where the sewer line would go through the road. Um, and if, is that going to take up any headspace? Um, so I don't understand why the sewer line, is that going to be a separate filing? And why wouldn't you file it with this? Um, so the, I guess, I guess those are the comments overall. Uh, and like I said, I hope the commission reads our comments because, you know, we would really like to avoid another appeal here. Um, but if we have to do it, then we will, because we really feel strongly that uh, we really need to get the mean annual high water uh, delineated properly with these brooks. And um, the idea that um, that brook is constrained by the summer channel and that it's not, it doesn't go into that whole area is crazy because you can go out there, you can see how it goes into that area. And it has been like that now. Um, you know, for six months, it's actually more than six months, <laughs> but, um, so, and maybe the commission should take a walk out there and see it. So those are, those are my comments. Thank you very much. I appreciate the commission's time. Thank you. Thanks, Suzanne. Um, uh, is, is anyone else uh, wishing to speak, uh, Valerie? I don't have any other raised hands right now. So I don't believe so. Okay. <coughs> so we are going to continue the hearing till June 2nd. Um, could I have a motion to that effect, please? So moved. Thanks, Ron. And a second? Second. Thank you, Laura. Um, how do you vote, Vinny? Yes. Laura? Yes. Ron? Yes. Um, Alex? Yes. And I vote yes as well. So we'll see you on the second. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks for your, thanks for your presentation. Thank you very much. Sure. Good night. Good night. The next item on the agenda is a notice of intent for 135 Wildwood Street. Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Luke Roy, LJR Engineering. On behalf of the applicant, Carl Krupe, uh, we've uh, submitted this notice of intent for 135 Wildwood Street. And I'll just uh, share my screen real quick and pull up the plan. Oops. So this is um, 135 Wildwood Street, Lot 2, which was just subdivided out of the overall uh, 3.8 acre uh, property that's currently 135 Wildwood Street. I, the existing home here is uh, to the south and this newly created lot is uh, to the north of the existing home. Um, so we've identified uh, wetland resource areas. Um, this is a bordering vegetated wetland to the rear, uh, which is associated with the, the uh, Mill Brook, which is several hundred feet from Wildwood Street back towards the rear. 
Um, and we've got that 100 foot wetland buffer from the BBW, this dotted line here. Um, we've also identified the 100 year flood elevation, um, which is mostly off site and basically contained within the uh, BBW. Um, so the proposed project is a new single family home on this lot. Um, you can see the proposed home here, which is located entirely outside of the wetland buffer. Um, they're essentially the work that will fall within the um, resource area or, or the buffer zone, I should say, is the septic system here uh, to the rear, which would be 91 feet from the BBW at the closest point and some associated grading, uh, breakout grading from, uh, from the septic system. Um, we've got the erosion control on there um, around the, the edge of the extent of limit of work. Um, but the, the wetland itself, the uh, 200 foot um, out of riparian buffer from the from the river as well as the flood uh, 100 year flood elevation is, is they're all significantly um, a significant diff distance back from the from the uh, proposed work and, and the limit of work there um, you know as i said at the home outside the buffer zone we've incorporated the uh, stormwater measures roof drain system um, and some of the erosion control measures that will be required as part of the, uh, to comply with the stormwater, uh, the local stormwater bylaw requirements. Um, but really that the, the work and the buffer, as I said, is limited to the, to the septic system and the uh, associated grading. Um, so that, that's a quick summary of, of the, the proposed project and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Luke. Um, Cameron? Uh, I don't believe we had any uh, comments for this. Um, I did speak, uh, when I did do the erosion controls check, um, there was some trash on the um, inside of the erosion controls. And the gentleman that I spoke to said, um, I, I forget his name off the top of my head, um, said that once they went in there and removed that, they would bring in um, the erosion controls. Um, a little more. There was probably about ten more feet they could have brought him in, um, but other than that, we have no, no, no comments. Okay. Um, do you, by chance, have a uh, an order drafted for this? We do. Okay. Um, Vinny, do you have any questions? I don't have any questions. Laura. No questions. Ron. Did you have any questions, Ron? No, I don't. No. Okay, Alex? No. Uh, nor do I. Um, so uh, we can close the hearing. And is there a way we can view the draft conditions? We can. Um, and I also okay. don't see any um, hands raised um, for comments or questions. Oops. From I'm sorry. the audience. Well, that's okay. I'm watching, I'm watching for you. Um, Got my back. So, Thank you. <laughs> so far, we don't have any hands raised. So, um, but yes, if you, I can pull up the, um, the draft order. Yeah, that'd be great. Uh, but, and here it is. Um, we didn't have any, um, anything but boilerplate um, conditions for this. Um, they addressed everything on the plans. Um, okay. So um, we can run through it, um, but you're, you're not gonna see anything special, I guess. And actually, in fact, we took out some of the typical um, ongoing because there's no um, demarcation because the wetlands are so far um, from the limit of work. Um, so there's no demarcation that, that runs with this. Um, so it's really just standard conditions. Okay. Uh, 
Is everyone comfortable with that? Yes. Okay. Let's uh, let's move first to close the hearing for uh, 135 Wildwood. Is it? Yeah, 135 Wildwood Street. Could I have a motion, please? So moved. Move. Um, okay, Vinny, a second. You want me to second? Second. Then Ron made the motion and Vinny seconded the motion. Um, how do you vote, Vinny? Yes. Laura? Yes. Ron? Yes. Alex? Yes. And Don, yes. So the hearing is closed. Um, now a motion to issue orders of conditions for 135 Wildwood Street. Um, could I have a motion? So moved. Thank you, Vinny. A second? Second. Thank you, Ron. Uh, how do you vote, Vinny? Yes. Laura? Yes. Ron? Yes. Alex? Yes. Don? Yes. Good. We're, we're set on that then. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Next on the agenda is a continued public hearing for a notice of intent for Shady Lane Drive. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we received a, a request um, from the town engineer to continue this hearing to the June 2nd meeting. Okay. And um, the, the plans that you received, um, they were revised um, and we didn't have um, any comments on those. So we're gonna prepare some, uh, a draft order for next time for you to consider. Okay. Uh, you said that you're gonna give us new plans? Um, probably not new plans. Okay. Um, so you can hold on to those, yep. yeah. Um, could I have a motion to continue the hearing for Shady Lane Drive to June 2nd? So moved. Thank you, Vinny. Second? I'll second it. What the heck? Um, how do you vote, Vinny? Yes. Laura? Yes. Ron? Yes. Alex? Yes. And myself, yes. So that is continued. Uh, next, we have a continued public hearing for 67 Main Street. Yeah, this is for 687 Main Street and um, the applicant has also requested to continue um, to the June 2nd meeting. Um, they have yet to, they're in the process of applying for their special permit for groundwater. Um, so that's their next step on that and following their application of that, um, you could actually take action on the, on the application. Okay. Again, a motion to continue the continued public hearing for 687 Main Street. Approved. Thank you, Vinny. A second? Second. Thank you, Ron. Uh, how do you vote, Vinny? Yes. Laura? Yes. Ron? Yes. Alex? Yes. Uh, Don? Yes. So that is continued. We have a continued public hearing for an ANRAD for 6 Tobin Drive. Yeah. Good evening. Uh, my name is Andy Bajasic with Dana Perkins. Uh, we're the engineer on the project for Tobin Drive. Um, this was submitted in early winter uh, 2020. Um, it got, was subject to peer review and due to some factors, including snow and whatnot, um, the peer review wasn't completed till uh, late March, early April. Um, and so we're resubmitting tonight uh, with just some minor revisions to the plan based on the peer review. Okay. Is the peer reviewer here as well? 
Yeah, uh, Tom Paragallo from LEC. Hi, Tom. Over here. Hi. Yeah. So, um, are you satisfied that all of your recommendations have made it into the the plan? Yeah, uh, I'll be brief because I know it's late. Sure. Um, Cameron and I both went out to the site in March and uh, looked at the delineation and we identified two areas that needed some adjustment. Um, I, uh, Cameron left and I went back out to collect the data and then set up, uh, we, we uh, flagged uh, the two areas so it would be well known and hopefully eliminate a lot of back and forth. Uh, they apparently uh, accepted the delineation, put it on their new or their revised ANRAD plan. Um, I believe that was dated April, um, April 16th. And, um, and that plan essentially um, encompasses the, the recommendations we made and we have no other further comment on the delineation. Thank you, Tom. Yep. Uh, Cameron. We, we good to go now? I believe so, yes. Okay. Uh, so, could I have a motion to close the hearing for the NRAD for, uh, let me ask for public comment. Just in time. I don't and, see any hands raised, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Uh, could I have a motion then to close the hearing for uh, the NRAD for Six Tobin Drive, then, please. So moved. Thank you, Laura. Second. There's a second out here for anybody. Ron, I think you want a second. Second. <laughs> Thank you, Ron. How do you vote, Vinny? Yes. Laura? Yes. Ron? Yes. Alex? Yes. Uh, Don, yes. And now it's been a while. I forget, what do we actually do? We actually issue? What are the right words? Yeah, you're going to um, approve the, the delineation plan that's dated April 15th, 2021. And okay. yeah. Will do. So um, could I have a motion then to approve the delineation for Six Tobin Drive dated April 15th. So moved. Thank you, Ron. Second? Second. Second, thank you, Laura. All in, uh, Vinny, how do you vote? Yes. Laura? Yes. Ron? Yes. Alex? Yes. And myself, yes. Good. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, next, we have a continued public hearing for an ANRAD for 71 and 73 Marion Street. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Luke Roy, LJR Engineering. I'll just quickly go through um, the updates that we made to this uh, delineation plan. Um, so we, we went out, uh, I, I know that the town's uh, peer review consultant met with uh, Mary Trudeau out um, on site and they walked the, the uh, BBW line and also looked at the, the Brook uh, Bank delineation. And um, we went out and surveyed, we located a number of uh, new flags and, and lo relocated flags and updated the um, delineation to reflect that. Uh, we also went out and located some more um, bank flags, updated that, and also updated the 200 foot riverfront buffer, which in the original plan, it, it just kind of barely touched the property line, um, which it, it still, pretty much that case and it's contained within the 
PVW in the areas that it comes on to the to the actual site. Um, I and I apologize. I think I may have been confused with the wording of the original review letter that there was another section of flagging AA1 through AA7 that I, I think I read it incorrectly that it was determined not to be part of the river but um, from the resources that we have as far as looking at the GIS mapping the USGS map it looks like upstream of that first bank flag it seems that it the river clearly bends away from the site um, from everything that we we've, we've looked at um, so that that's kind of we, we did not locate that those additional flags um, just updated the these downstream uh, new bank flags um, and the only other thing I wanted to just mention is that we did go out and we did a really detailed field survey of the, um, we went along the entire BVW boundary and we, which we already had elevations at each of the wetland flags, but we also went and we shot spot grades within the BVW and then up gradient of the wetland line. Um, and we, we used those to develop the 100 year flood elevation that we've shown on the plan here. And uh, so there is detail backup to what we have here and based on a field survey, um, we could certainly try to add some of that spark rate information or supplement this. I just at a 40 scale plan, it, it might get kind of busy trying to show that level of detail, but I just wanted to just point out that we did, uh, we, we spent some, some significant time um, to try to get that in on the plan to include it, but um, that's it. And I don't know uh, if there's any other follow-up questions. Um, we did just get another review uh, follow-up letter, which we'd be happy to take a look at that and, and answer any questions that the commission has. A, a quick question: how, how would you, in fact, add the spot grades? Would you would you create a separate document? Um, um, spreadsheet or something like that? I mean, it might have would... to be something that if we can add them, it, depending on the formatting and if it's legit, you know, how clear it is, if things aren't all overlapping or too busy, we may have to blow up and do a couple sections of 20 scale or, or 30 scale or something that um, it, if, if that was going to be required, we could do that. Um. Is, is that something that, that's not something that we would require. It would be something that your, your client may, may want, but I don't know that we would need it, right? Is that correct, Cameron? I believe so, yeah. So you, you, could, you could provide it, but there would be a delay involved or you could, we could go ahead with what you've, what you've got. Yeah, I mean, I'm confident in with what we have that it's accurate, and uh, and in this backup, we have the information in the survey uh, okay. information. So I, I'm fine with it as as we presented it. I know that there was just a question on that, the level of detail on it. Okay, um, Cameron, what's what's your thought on this? Are we good to go? I think so. Yeah. Any uh, Mr. questions? Sorry, Mr. Chairman, if I could just jump in. Um, um, could I ask, um, just to clarify, on the original request, um, it was for BVW and um, mean annual high water for riverfront. Luke, are you um, are you now requesting that land subject to flooding be a part of this ANRAD? Um, that was my understanding that that was kind of a request or comment of the review letter that we received. And I think it was at the very end on uh, April 7th. And we already had a lot of the information. So I, I felt that 
to take the opportunity where we're already updating a plan to, to add that resource area to, to the uh, plan. But uh, sorry if I, would, if I misunderstood that. The first time through, I think that um, Riverfront itself was not uh, part of the delineation. And I think that got added this time, but now you're mentioning BLSF as well, Valerie? Yeah, so Mr. Chairman, our peer reviewer, Mary Rimmers, on the, in the meeting, maybe she could um, speak to, um, to the comments. I don't think you've heard from her yet. So she had actually two, two comment letters in the time that, that um, this has been before you. Maybe she could speak to, um, to some of those sure. things. I think there might be some still some outstanding issues um, to be addressed but she could probably speak to those. Great. And you said she's- Thanks, I'm here. It's Mary Rimmer oh, from good. Rimmer Environmental. Hi. And um, I did walk the site with Mary Trudeau and um, we made some adjustments to the BBW boundary and those have all been um, reflected in these revised plans. And so I'm comfortable that the bordering vegetative wetland boundary is um, accurately depicted at this point. And um, the riverfront flags were extended. Um, they're only, a, two or three or maybe three or four flags that were shown in the original plan. Um, so they've been extended to the east um, so that the, the flags, the 200 foot offset could be more accurately depicted where it intersects the property line um, since the river is actually off the property. We also extended um, flags um, upstream to the west. And uh, if I understand the um, Surveyor correctly that those were not located because there's a bend in the river, and um, it was determined that those flags would be more than 200 feet from the property. And based on my, in, you know, in inspection of the aerials, I would concur that that's that's probably accurate that it does bend away. So um, those flags probably aren't necessary to demonstrate any riverfront area on the project site. And then the other comment, um, one other comment had to do with the. Um, 100 year flood plain since it was shown on the plans I just was questioning whether there was adequate um, survey documentation to actually establish the 100, 100 year flood plain since that any portion of the 100 year flood plain that extends landward of the bordering vegetated wetland boundary would then be bordering land subject to flooding and there are a couple of areas very small areas where that occurs and I was just questioning because most of the site has just two foot contours whether or not um, you know there was sufficient survey detail to be able to establish that elevation and I'm com com more comfortable now um, with Mr. Roy's explanation that he did actually do spot elevations within the wetland and upgraded up the wetland line to establish that boundary. Um, so I'm, I'm certainly more comfortable with that um, at this point. And the other thing is that there's a note on the plan that says there are additional wetland resource areas on the, um, there are no additional wetland resource areas in the remaining back portion of 73 Marion Street. And I did not review any property, portion of the property um, beyond the stone wall shown on this plan here. So I can't concur that there is, aren't, there are not any other resources beyond this plan here. Um, so if there is, if that was intended to be part of this ANRAD, I was not aware of it and um, had, hadn't reviewed that area. I can tell you there's nothing within 100 feet of the stone wall, but if the property extends beyond that, there is, um, I, I didn't have a chance to take a look at that area. Now, I'll just add real quick that that note kind of got to the, one of the DEP's comments regarding clarifying the extent of the ANRAD and, and so we updated the locus map to kind of show clearly the shaded area of what comprises 71 and 73 Marion back to the town line. And um, be up beyond that stone wall, it's, it continues to slope up in uh, all upland area. But I understand as, as Mary said that they didn't uh, know that or didn't go beyond that stone wall as far as part of the site review. 
Would it be cured by just eliminating the note? Yeah, if that's uh, the, um, what the commission would prefer, we could certainly just remove the note. We could remove the note and then um, include in any um, order of resource area delineation that's issued that there was, is no determination made beyond this, you know, whatever direction that is west of the stone wall. Sure, okay. Um, for the commissioners, Jenny, you have any questions? No. No. Laura? No. Ron? No. Alex? I hear no. Um, nor do I. So, um, we can close the hearing and we can approve the delineation will excuse me sitting in the hall of clocks here um so we can uh, uh, we can also note that that there was no um there was no survey performed beyond the stone wall. Yeah, we can note that there was no determination of resource areas beyond the stone wall boundary. Okay, good. You may uh, also want to note that any, any floodplain that extends landward of the bordering vegetated wetland boundary is bordering land subject to flooding. Would you repeat that, please, Mary? So any, any of the delineated floodplain, 100 year floodplain boundary? that extends landward of the bordering vegetated wetland boundary, the BVW boundary, would be considered bordering land subject to flooding. Okay, gotcha. So we'll add that as well, Valerie? Sure, yes. Good. Okay, could I have a motion to close the hearing for 71 and 73, Marion? So moved. Thank you, Vinny. Second? Second. Thank you, Ron. How do you vote, Vinny? Yes. Laura? Yes. Ron? Yes. Luke? Oh, sorry. Just, you were there in order. Uh, Alex? <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, and Don, yes. Um, it's getting late, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Haven't had supper either. So the, um, so we're, we're going to Approve the delineation. We have two things added. One of them was a, a statement to the effect that uh, no serving for for resources were done um, on the other side of the stone wall, mm -hmm. south of the stone wall, and that bordering land subject to flooding is shown. You have the wording down already, right? Yeah, any of the 100 year floodplain landward of the BVW. Yeah, very good, thank you. Um, so could I have a motion to approve the delineation with those additions? Moved. Thank you, Vinny. A second? I'll second it. How do you vote, Vinny? Yes. Laura? Yes. Ron? Yes. I'm going to skip you, Luke. Uh, Alex? Yes. And myself, yes. Thank you. OK, thank you. Have a good night. Yeah, you as well. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. Um, How are you feeling, Laura? You know, we're, we're down to the certificates of compliance and some discussions without an audience. So if you- I'm feeling you excellent. Feel, I want to amputate my arm right now. So you're going to hang in? I'm going to hang in. Okay, great. Um, so we have a, 
a request for a certificate of compliance for 375 Ballard Vale. Yes, I'm Drew Garvin. I'm with Meridian Associates. Uh, we were the original engineer on this project. Um, it looks like my camera's a little wonky, but I'll try to power through here. Um, I'm gonna share the screen and uh, for the plan. Let's see if I can get there. Everyone see that? Uh, yeah, yeah, got it. Got it? Okay, so this is uh, <clears throat> 375 is the FedEx uh, building. Mm -hmm. uh, on, and 377 is this driveway. There's, this is actually a property line right here. And it's a driveway that comes up and goes all the way in the back, uh, servicing another uh, commercial building in the back. And a couple of years ago, we uh, re- paved and put in some, uh, improved the stormwater management structures with some, some treatment units uh, and also added um, a uh, guard house right where my hand is and uh, kind of improved the area around it and just basically upgraded the site, which was mostly in encompassing uh, repaving. Uh, this was done under uh, under FedEx as the, as the applicant, and the owner is actually Howland Development, who owns these properties. Um, and it was lost in translation that these projects were never closed out. So that's why I'm here today, just to close these projects out. Uh, again, they've been completed for a couple of years. Uh, this as-built is dated um, almost exactly two years ago, May of 2019. Um I don't think there were any issues. We had, it was, I don't know if any of you remember it. I don't I think the board was a bit different then. And I don't think even uh, Cam, Cameron was on board then. Uh, but, uh, you know, everything was completed cleanly. And uh, it's just a matter of, of closing the books. I think they wanted to refinance on one of the properties and, and it came to light that it was still on the deed. So, that's why I'm here with you today. I, I guess I can answer any questions you may have on the property, but uh, that's the, the the overall gist of it. Okay, thank you, Joe. Cameron, are we good to go on both of the uh, Ballard Vale addresses? So uh, High and I went out, High from Engineering went out uh, the other day and there was an area of concern um, in the back right corner. It looks like there's some riprap inside the BBWs. Um, so we wanted to go and check out that before uh, we gave the okay, but we were not allowed um, past the guardhouse. Um, <laughs> so we have to, we rescheduled our, our site visit for next Friday. Okay. And that's for both of the Ballard Vale addresses? Correct. Okay. So is that right here? Correct. Yep. So... I believe, I don't, I don't have the design plans up, but, um, sorry, I'm panning around here. Um, this was one of the areas that was improved. This rip wrap was installed. Mm -hmm. uh, and this, um, is this, see this CDS unit here? Mm -hmm. This is a treatment unit pr prior to the improvement of the property. Uh, these catch basins just ran straight out uh, but we in installed this treatment unit, uh, which treats the, uh, the storm water and uh, is a better, it does a better job of removing the solids uh, prior to discharging into the wetlands. So, and then when it did discharge, I think this, um, this air, this pipe just daylighted into the, into what is a fairly steep bank here. And we added kind of a riprap plunge pool to, to help with any erosion uh, possible erosion problems uh, and improve that condition as well. So just to, just to give you a background okay. on why that's there. Okay. Um, so it was intentionally, you know, that, that's not a mistake, I guess, is what I want to make clear. Mm -hmm. uh, that was to improve what was a really a non-treated condition. 
uh, was it on the plan? Was it on the plan? The best we could. Yeah, it's right here. Oh, I, was it on the the not the, the ice plans? Plan. Yes, yeah, on the design plans, and I can provide those to Cam to Cameron if uh, if that helps. Okay. Yeah. And, and the commission, okay. obviously. Okay. Good. Good. Okay. Let's table both of these um, requests then until Cameron makes his visit. So we'll take it up again in June. Okay. So Cameron, I'm, I'm trying to remember, I remember this happened to me too when I was visiting the site, you know, during construction, obviously they're very secure and that's what's yeah, part of the yeah, project. Yeah it, was, yeah, it was really secure there. <laughs> so I'm trying to remember what the best way to get you in there. I'm trying to, you know, after I after I had to jump the hurdle a couple of times, they knew who I was and I could get an easier, but um, I'm trying to think of what the protocol should be to get you in there so you don't get stuck, you know, at the gate again. I, I believe Hi um, called someone um, that's going to let us in Friday morning. Okay. So okay. I, th I think we have, we're, I think we're under control on that, on that end of it. Okay. If you have any problems, uh, let me know and I'll track down the right person to talk okay. to. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, could I have a motion to, to table the request for a certificate of, of compliance for 375 and 377 Ballard Street, please? A move. A move. Uh, let's see. I'm going to give that one to Ron and a second. Second. The second is Vinny. How do you vote, Vinny? Yes. Laura? Yes. Ron? Yes. Alex? Yes. And Don, yes. So pushing on, we're at, we're at the administrative tree or shrub removal. We can thank you for your, your um, administrative action there. Is there anything you want to sort of tell us or should we pass on to the next item? Can I mean, yeah, there's not, there's not much to say. Um, they had six trees, um, but uh, the four other trees that they wanted to remove are healthy. So, um, and these are the two damaged trees. So they're gonna, they took these ones out uh, administratively and they're gonna come back in at a later point and remove the four healthy trees uh, through an RDA. Okay. But other than um, that, no. The notice of violation for six towpath. Um, yep. So a couple of weeks ago, uh, they removed two, two pine trees uh, within the 100 foot buffer zone to uh, BBWs. Um, and they, ha since then, have already gotten their wetlands delineated are, and are uh, in the process of completing their RDA. And I believe actually they, they, they submitted it to us um, already for the next uh, meeting. I don't, I don't, I'm not sure if they're here or not. Um, if they are, they'd like to say something, but. Sue just unmuted and yeah. then muted. Is Sue, would you like to say something? Are there any hands raised, Valerie? There are not. Okay. So we'll pass on to updates for 66 Lawrence. Someone's trying to talk. Yeah, the the big phone at the bottom there, right? Yeah, yeah. You can you can oh. speak. Go ahead. Oh, this is Attorney Phil Taylor for the property owner at sixty six Lawrence Street. I'm sorry, I was waiting. I was waiting to be recognized. No, it's okay. Sorry about that. No, you're on. Okay. Um, yeah. So yeah, I'm I'm calling in tonight. Um, provide an update, and I believe um the the tenant who's actually doing the work, Claudia, I believe she's. I'm probably still in the meeting as well. Um, so after the last meeting, um, a wetland scientist was retained. They did go out there and they um, flagged the wetlands. And right now an engineer has uh, a survey is required. So an engineer has been retained. Um, they're pretty busy. Um, so it's actually, um, she's gonna be working with right now. It's like uh, Luke Roy at uh, LJR Engineering. I presume he's not still around because I think his hearings are done. And um, 
based upon his time frame, I believe they're uh, looking to file the application by June 16th for the July meeting. Okay. Good. Thanks, we hope to see you then. Great, well, thank you very much. Yeah, good night now. Uh, for up, update for five Oxbow. Uh, good evening, uh, Joe Lavrato, the um, owner of Five Oxbow. I retained, um, ironically, Oxbow Associates to come out and do a delineation. <laughs> and uh, they're coming out tomorrow. And uh, I should have paperwork submitted, hopefully, in a few weeks for the June meeting. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. See you then. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Okay, we're down to the donation of land. Yes, Mr. Chairman, um, we received um, an inquiry um, some time ago. I'm going to share my screen so you can see our DS maps. Um, there's a large parcel of land. Um, actually, some of you may know very well because it's close to your homes. Um, it's bordered by um, sort of the Arlene Ave um, neighborhood um, to the south and then the railroad tracks um, to the west and Route 93 to the east, about 66 acres of land. Um, a lot of it, uh, a portion of it is wetlands, um, but there is a, a sizable upland piece, but it's landlocked, um, kind of stuck between the wetlands and the tracks and the highway. Um, and some other wetlands. So the owner of this is um, looking to donate it to the town as conservation land. And um, it's actually pretty exciting because it's um, a lot of habitat and it's borders an area, a priority area of rare species. Um, so I think it's a really good addition to the open space in town. And um, so if you would like to kind of put on this donation to um, accept it. Um, that's the first part of the process for the commission to accept it. And then the Board of Selectmen would um, would approve that donation. Great. How do you feel, Vinny? Yes. Good. Yeah. Laura? Yes. Ron? Fine. Good. Alex? Good. All right, so we'll so we'll take an actual vote then, right? Everybody seems to be ready to do it. Uh, how would you like it to sound? To accept, we vote to accept the. Let me just get the um, the page. Yep. Land map two P eleven. Sure. Yeah, that, that's fine, yep. Okay, so could I have a motion to accept the donated the donation of land designated map R2 P11? So moved. Thank you, Vinny. Second? Yeah. Anybody? Second. Anybody. Second from Ron, okay. How do you vote, Vinny? Yeah. Laura? Yes. Ron? Yes. Alex? Yes. And myself, yes. And thank you, Mrs. Lewis O'Neill. All right. Uh, down to Keolis. Is that true? Yes, and that this is just um, on here to make you aware. We put the um, the notice in your packet, make you aware of your um, yearly operating plan. Um, if you have any questions or want to discuss it, we can put it on a future agenda as well. Okay. And finally, the meeting minutes from last meeting. I think everybody was here, right? Let me look at the attendance. 
Yes, everyone who's here now was here then. Have you all had a chance to read the minutes from April 7th? I yes. got a nod from Laura, Ron, Alex, yes? Have you yes. read them? Yes. And Vinny, have you had a chance to look at them? The meeting minutes from All April? set. Okay. All set. Um, could I have a motion to accept the meeting minutes for the April 7th meeting? So moved. Ron gets that one. Second. Going once. I'll second. All right. Gets a second. All I'm waiting for you to do, Vinny. <laughs> so, Vinny, how do you vote? Yes. Laura? Yes. Uh, Ron? Yes. Alex? Yes. And me, yes. Is that all? Are we done? All for tonight. Thanks for sticking with us, Laura. Hope you hope you feel fine. Yeah, yeah. feel better. Tomorrow. I feel like I lost a fight with Bruce Lee. So <laughs> his shot hurts. Ouch. <laughs> yeah. I'll make a motion to go to bed. <laughs> Is there a second? Second. All right. <laughs> How do you vote, Vinny? Yes. Laura. Yes. Ron. Yes. Alex. Yes. Myself, yes. It's All right. been fun. <laughs> Thank you. We'll see you in June. See you in June. Yeah. Good night. Good night, everybody. Good night. All right.